Hello and welcome everyone today to the third episode of the TechCast podcast. Today I have a very special guest joining me who is the owner of Greased Monkey Games. Dustin, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, yeah, my name's Dustin. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, well, basically what I do, um, we make quality of life items for you know playing Warhammer and in the future we'd like to branch out but you know we're very new so we're trying to focus down on uh, product line right now um, but you know right now we have um, the we make uh, some rulers I'm working on some other ones um, and then mainly the thing uh, trying to focus down on right now is uh we make magnetic movement trays so for transportation and gameplay excellent so you your product line is kind of regular trays movement magnetic movement trays a couple different rulers and things of that nature so that when someone's playing the game they can move their models a little more easily and then they can also do some measurements uh without having to really force a tape measure between models they can just do it quickly with one of your tools is that correct yeah the um you're you're referring to the deep strike roller um and it's a thing i just kind of made when i was you know like i said I'm, i've been doing this about a month and a half i'm very new to it but um it's something i made and i just kind of put it in posted it in like what do you guys think about this and the response to it was very positive so um people like it um and we've been selling quite a bit of them and it's just kind of been a ride this last month so so how'd you how'd you get started like what was the first time you made one of these things and you were like i want to make this or what was what was the driving force and the motivation behind it uh well earlier this year i picked up a 3d printer and i was just kind of toying with it and we were making some print some stuff out we found for board games to you know storage and just little things and then right around let me say to may april may area um my landlord where i for the house i rent he uh let me know hey um i'm going to be selling the house to my son so we're not going to be re-upping your lease so and at that point, I'm kind of panicking because rent prices in my area has gone up about 30 percent. And it's not something me and my wife are financially prepared for. So I was just kind of thinking, you know, what could I make? What could I make? What could I make? I need to do something to pick up the slack of that extra money. And so I was looking around and like, well. The, there's movement trays I, I mean i can print these off they're fairly easy to print off i had per personally purchased some myself before i had gotten a 3d printer and so i started making them the, the basic ones that are like flat with the lip on them that you just kind of set your models down in and um well i started making those and you know we're selling a few of them and then we're still looking for another place and again housing's a nightmare to find in my area so we're still me and my wife are still kind of panicking about what are we going to do um and then my landlord calls me back you know a week or two later and he's like oh my son got a different house you don't have to move and i kind of just kept going with it from there and then you expanded from the trays into the magnetic bases first, or was it deep strike rulers? Um, I went from the magnetic bases first because, um, well, those trays are really basic. And, you know, I'm using them myself, and, you know, you go to push them, the models fall out, you got to put them back. Um, and then I was, you know, trolling my Facebook groups, and someone had posted, they had bought a, a, a magna rack, which is basically a shelving unit with sheet metal that you can use for transportation of your models and he was looking for you know movement trays because he wanted movement trays but he was also looking for something that he can use to transport his models on the movement trays and so i got thinking i'm like okay what can i do to help him 
And so I went around, I was looking up magnetic movement trays, things like that. And the things I was seeing that they just didn't impress me. So then I started going a little further in it. I'm like, you know, what isn't available? What are they not doing? What are they doing wrong? What could they do better? And so, you know, on that list of things was either they're, it's a, just a movement tray. It's not magnetic or it sticks out and you just, it's an eyesore or, um, it's magnetic kind of, um, cause there's these ones that I found that, um, they're apparently they're very popular, but it's not actually a magnetic movement tray. It's just a piece of sheet metal with like a coating on it. So what you still end up doing is you have to try to center the magnet on your model, which is a pain. And then you have with that, you know, you end up having to center your model on the movement tray. Well, yes, it can be done. No, it's not that much work, but it's a hassle. So I'm like, okay, well, why don't, let's see if I can make a movement tray that has no lip that will magnetically stick to, you know, the piece of sheet metal. But let's also magnetize the model to the movement tray because you have to have a lip to hold the models on unless you have something else holding them on. And so that's where I ended up going through it. And I designed a movement tray that, you know, it comes with the magnets. The, they're specifically sized for your bases to the point where when you go to set your model down on there, there's a rim on it that will align your model to the right spot and all you have to do is clean off the bottom of the base of your model and flatten it out where the magnet will contact put a drop of glue on the magnet that's already there and just set your model down and let the glue dry and then you're, that's all you got to do so yeah i saw the video where you took the model you essentially just put the glue on the magnet that was attached to the other magnet and then you just pressed it down and it seemed like it made it way easier to line things up than uh i would have thought of doing it so that's definitely yeah that's a huge benefit yeah that's that's what i was going for just ease of use like yeah. if if i'm going to sell somebody something let me make it as easy as possible yeah. if, if i had a way to flatten your bases for you i i I'd do that but i don't unfortunately <laughs> um so yeah. and how did the idea come for i guess the deep strike <clears throat> ruler and the engagement tool and we'll look at a little more in depth shortly but i'm just kind of curious how you came up with those uh well okay the deep strike ruler what brought that on is i play orcs and anybody who's ever played orcs know orcs like to use to jump and when we use to jump we are moving 30 models across the board that we have to measure out and get you know nine inches um because we you know we don't want to measure out more than nine inches because we're gonna charge you immediately um so you know you sit there with the your tape measure out, measuring out nine inches, you put it on the thing and then you're just sweeping it back and forth, trying to find that arc where all your guys can be nine inches. Um, so I was like, well, I can make this arc. So, you know, I, I did a couple things with it. I made a couple iterations of it. I tried making one with a flat end. That doesn't work where you, the fo where the uh, ruler contacts the enemy model. You can't make it flat because it, if you're off from the center, it's it's not going to measure right. Yeah, let me just put um real quick. I'm going to put that on screen so people can see it. I have two pictures of the ones you make. Um, one is the traditional black one showing between Orcs and Adeptus Mechanicus, and the other is a purple one. And uh, what you're referring to is that little point at the end of it that's in this picture or in the pictures is at the Mechanicus side. So I've seen some similar um versions of these but they had like a flat end and that's what you're referring to is where you get that uh incorrect measurement when you have that yeah situation. yeah the the point on it it acts as a center as the center of a circle so the center of the circle is always the same distance from or the the edge of the circle is always the same distance from the center of the circle so that's where that point comes into play that point plays the role of the center of the circle if you have it flat you're moving the center now the the picture you have on the left um when i my when i first put that up there people and you know i didn't think about it at first uh people are saying yeah but the ones on the edge are going to be um 
too close to the ones on the edge. So the where the mechanicus are lined up. So you know, there's a simple solution to that. And basically, what you do is you just on the arc, you put your finger in the center, and then you sweep that the point across the front line of the enemy. And what that's going to do, shameless plug, especially if you have my movement trays that holds everything together, um, is going to take your models and it's going to push them back to that distance that you need to be. So you swing it to the left, it's going to push the ones on the left. Then you swing it back to the right, it's going to push the ones on the right. And now all your guys are nine inches. Yeah, I saw the, I saw the video of that on uh, your Etsy store. It's actually very informative because I was watching that before we start here. I'm like, oh, that makes sense because I was thinking a little bit. I'm like, well, you have that arc there. So the one on the very left or I guess on the very top or the very bottom, they're going to be a little closer because the arc, it gets narrower. But then I saw you do that sweep and it's very easy because that tool allows you to even move the models um, with a tray and everything else that lets you kind of readjust, and reposition the models. So I think that's really cool. Um, and if you didn't have that point there, it would be harder to align it properly as you would either have too much of a distance or too little of a distance because you would always be on a flat versus a point and the bases right. aren't fully um, flat. The other thing I'll put on screen there is the bases that we were talking about. Um, unfortunately, the picture gets a little weirdly compressed just because of the streaming software. But there was something interesting you mentioned about those trays as well because you have the different color ones there. Uh, can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about those colors? Uh, which trays are we talking about? Um, the movement trays, so the ones that the models just the basic, inside. Yep. The basic ones. Oh, the the colors. Uh, yeah, we can print them up in any color. Um, well, the, I have it stock. Now, I've, the blue ones, um, I've actually discontinued the blue ones um, until I find a better uh, material because that material actually, it doesn't work well. Um, I, I've found that it, the way it prints, it just it's not very good. But um, so I, I was I will be in the future beginning to print the magnetic ones in the different colors um, because at, at least I do it. I don't I don't know about a whole bunch of other people, but you know you have a unit of models and especially again orcs, uh, you have a lot of them. You know you you paint the rims of the bases a certain color. So this is this unit. This is this unit. This is this unit. Well, what if you want to change them later? Ah, so the idea is because my the bases that I make, uh, the the ones with the the basic ones with the lip, those are obvious to see. So you can color code your units by that. Now, when I start making the colors available for the magnetic ones, uh, they're very low profile. Um, it, it varies from uh, model to model, but the Profile under your actual base is usually less than two millimeters. Um, so again, I, I when I was making, I did not want to see trays when I was making them. So I was trying to make them as invisible as possible. Um, but even still, once I get the colors going up for those, you'll be able to, you know, take your models and put them on different trays to signify different units with the colors. Now, the, in the state they are, they're, of course, paintable. Um, they're just PLA plastic, so they will take paint. Um, but another thing I've done with the trays is all of the magnets on the trays, they're all this, facing the same polarity. So the, they come pre-glued to the trays with an extra magnet on top for your model to go to. Um, but they're all facing the same polarity. So once you have a, ma a magnet attached to your model, you can move it to any of the trays and it will fit. Hmm. So I think that's, that's something very important to mention because um, it's not as visible in the pictures or anything. But so if someone buying these does not need to own any magnets individually. It comes with all the magnets and everything you need in order to attach to the base of the model and on the tray and everything. So they get everything when they order one of these trays to basically pull it out of the box. All they need is a little super glue, which they should have for their models as is, and then they're good to go, correct? Right. Excellent. And another reason that um, the magnets are there, one, for convenience, and two, they are very specifically engineered for the height of, or, well, the empty space, I guess would be the best way to say, of the uh, Games Workshop bases. 
So if you're getting different magnets, they may not be the same thickness as the magnets that are on there, which will throw off all the measurements. So and, uh, unfortunately, if you have an aftermarket base, I can't promise how well it's going to fit. Uh, there's too many different aftermarket bases for me to try to engineer all of them. Um, if at one point I hear about that there's an extremely popular aftermarket base that you know most people have, I can go about doing that. But until I hear word one about that, I I, I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at these here, and obviously these are different sizes. Uh, what kind of sizes do you have available, or uh, what are the plans for the future in terms of different size bases, and how? What's the, what's the limitation, I guess, on that? If someone was interested in, let's say, let's say you don't offer one of the bases, how would somebody go about contacting you or getting one made uh, for their size base or something of that nature? Uh, let's say it's a it's a GW base, but it's just a uh, forty millimeter. In case you don't have one of those, I don't know if you do or you don't. Um, um I, oh, I have the forty millimeters designed. I haven't listed them yet. Um, I, I've I've fulfilled an order for the 40 millimeters on request. Um, so that's when I actually finished the design for it because I hadn't listed it because it wasn't quite right. And I, I don't want to sell anything. It's not quite right. Um, so right now um, I have 32 millimeter, 25 millimeter in various formations. Uh, they're the most common models you're going to have on the table. Um, but my intention is to make a tray for every size base um, that Games Workshop puts out. Um, I will be putting singles, you know, single model, basically magnetic, uh, the trays, they're not really a tray, it's just, you know, to fit one model. So you have a character model that's by itself, you can still put it on that. Reason I'm just do I will be doing that is, they're not just trays for movement during the game, they're a transport solution. So uh, in order for someone to transport their whole army, I'm going to have to have bases available for everything. Um, so right now I'm working on um, making up several different formations. Um, I'm, I'm getting the 40 millimeters in several different formations. The 60 millimeter ovals, those are complete as well. Um, right now, the only thing I have that available on is the specific AdMech tray. Um, I made that one by request of my friend who plays AdMech. Um, and, um, but what I'm going to be doing um, beginning next month, I'm, I will be basically releasing a big chunk of available options. So we're going to have more options in the 32s. We're going to have more options in the 25s for, you know, things like gun lines. Um, and then I'll have the 40s available in the 60 millimeters. Once I get those done and those lines filled out, I'm going to start. I'm just going to basically work my way up the sizes. So 50 millimeter circle, 60 millimeter circle, work on the oval shapes, the big trays. Um, at one point, I'm, I will be making a specific base for the Silent King model and his uh, the, the shields that go around with him. Hmm. Um, so... And what are, what are some challenges, I guess, of making these bases? Because obviously you have to get them to the right <clears> measurements and specifications because they fit inside of the normal base, which makes them have that invisibility. What are some like challenges you run into and things of that nature? Uh, the biggest problem is I have to deal with uh, the, the material they're made out of. I mean, they are 3D printed. So what happens is the material comes out hot, built to measurement, and then it shrinks. So... I have to build them to the exact measurement, and then I have to adjust from there. So typically, to get the tray to fit the model, I'm going to go through, you know, depending on how lucky I get when I change things up, but, you know, five to ten iterations before I get it to fit right. Um, and that's the hardest part of it. Once I get that down, um, making the formations isn't that hard. Um, and oh, to answer your earlier question, um, I do accept custom formations if people want them. Um, the way you can get that, um, pretty simple. You can just email me, uh, and I mean, it's, uh, feedback 
at greasedmonkeygames.com. If you email me there with you know a formation, if I don't have it, I can draw it up for you. And you know that that'll be on my shop from then, and then you know we can get it out to you. And what was what was the hardest base to make? Was it the oval one there for the um, Arquebus guy, or was it a different one? Like, what was the most challenging uh, type of base uh, to make so far? <laughs> the oval. The oval was difficult because you can't build the oval to measurement. I don't know why. Um, it should. Um, part of it is because getting that arc on the base just right. Um, I I don't have tools for that to measure the specific arc on the base of the uh, Games Workshop tray. Um, so a lot of it was guess and check and repeat, guess and check and repeat. Um, I mean, the upside of the oval base, the way it's set up, you don't have to really scrape anything on the bottom of your model or on the bottom of the tray because where I have those magnets on there, and I have two on that tray because I, I want it to be secure. I, I, I could probably hold it with one, but... I, I don't want your models coming off. Um, the magnets that I use are fairly strong. Um, so they're not strong enough to where you go to pick up your model, it's going to break your model. But they're strong enough to where, you know, you stick it to some sheet metal and you can shake the crap out of it and it's not going to go anywhere. And speaking of the strength of those magnets, is this is something I looked at when I first saw this and it tripped me up a little bit, was I said, well, it would be nice to have some kind of movement hook or stick sticking out so I could pick up the entire tray. But you were telling me um, the other day that they're actually strong enough if you have, let's say, a, a five-man block, you could pick up the model and all four additional models will come with it uh, without you having to worry about the models uh, coming off and the tray dropping. Is that correct? And, uh, yeah, they they won't come off, and and they'll work. They, with they the, come uh, off when you want them to, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll work with the ten man unit as well, or just the fives and threes. Uh, with the, I I haven't made a ten man thirty two. I don't want to say the ten man as a blanket that they'll you know, it'll hold up. The ten man with the twenty fives for the admec, um, they'll hold. I wouldn't carry the model or carry the tray around by a single model. But you can pick it up to it, it'll hold for you to lift it off the table to get a better grip. Uh, but I, I wouldn't, that's just not something I would do. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to pick up one admec unit and go and carry the whole tray across the room by one admec unit. The, the movement, I wouldn't risk because, like I said, the magnets, they're not strong enough to break your models when they pick it up or when you pick it up. So if okay. if they were strong enough to where I could guarantee that, then you'd be breaking your models every time you took the model off. <laughs> yeah, so it's more of a where you lift it up by one model and then slide your hand underneath or grab it from underneath and yeah, no, it, you'll be able to get it off the table. Okay. So it's it's not going to be a precarious pickup where you go to try to pick it up, it comes up an inch or two, and then pops loose. Hmm. And is there um I guess is there any plans for the future to have a uh, some kind of movement stick or tool or something of that nature? Um. If I could, I thought of a couple ways of doing it because just having the stick itself sticking out of the thing, um, I don't, I don't like that idea. I mean, some people might, but me personally, I don't. I, when I look down at my army, I want to see my army. Um, now, if I did it like a permanent stick, then you know you're going to have an army with a whole bunch of sticks sticking up, um, and that just Visually, I don't find it appealing. Um, I also thought of using um, a stick with a magnet on the end to move them around. So basically, there's a magnet built into the tray. You have a stick that's magnetic. You put the stick down, and you can slide your guys across the table. Problem with that is, well, by the nature of the magnets, um, when you go to turn it, it's not going to turn the thing. It's just going to spin. So where I run into issues with that, I'd have to put in something that would grab physically the tray underneath to be able to do that. Um, now, any of the tight model trays, so I, I, I don't have any trays available yet. Um, those are planned um, that are farther spaced out. You know, I'm, I'm planning on having a half inch space, a one inch space, a two inch, just about you know, basically maximum cohesion spaced. Um, 
I might be able to fit them in there, but in the tight ones, uh, it's it's not gonna. There, there's nowhere for me to place the stick to move it around without adding to space. So I mean, I could take the five man cloud one as an example. I could put a little ear off the back of it to place that movement stick, but then you're gonna have problems when you're trying to cram your models together tightly. Yeah, and with um, other pieces of terrain and things like that, especially in corridors, that's where you right. run into some issues with like a lolly ear or something of that nature. Yeah. Right. And again, the they're strong enough right now to where you can just, you know, grab the model, move it by the model. I mean, if you didn't have the tray, how would you be moving them? You'd grab the model and move the model. So hmm. I mean And we've it's... we've oh sorry, I was gonna say um the question just came in that was kind of interesting, and we've touched on this a little bit already, because um, you mentioned you were going to make trays for all different sizes, but um, the question was, do you plan on making trays for, say, the Sulphur Hounds or Cerberus Raiders and the Admic uh, Taraxi, which are the little flyer guys? Because um, I think you mentioned something about the flyer guys in the past before as well. In terms yeah, of the, the, the custom trays that I made, the 40 millimeter ones. Um, that I'd sent out by request. Those were actually for the um, the Caraxi. Is that what she's called? I, I don't remember their name. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I don't play Admec. <laughs> <laughs> they all have weird names. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I made those for him um, at the time. Like they were still prototypes. So what I told him was, you know, I'm unsure if these magnets are going to be strong enough to hold those on because of the leverage of them being raised in the air. So, you know, I sent them to him, I sold them to him, and I told him, you know, if these don't hold right, let me know, I will redesign, and I will send you a fix. Um, but he said they held strong, so it was just something I was a little worried about. Um, now, the hounds, uh, what size are those? Those On are the like base? a cavalry oval. I think they're kind of similar the six- to the uh, Arquebus are they? Are they... Are they the sixty millimeter oval bases? If they are, I um, so. I've I've already drawn up a three tray of those and a five. So, what size unit do they typically go in? And I can specialize a tray for that. Okay, so that that's actually also interesting uh, that you mentioned there that you were very willing to work with the customer on that sense that hey, if if they made a prototype. It didn't work necessarily. You were willing to rectify that situation, so that's something very big. And yeah, I don't want to sell anybody something that doesn't work. Yeah, so it shows a lot of like customer focused uh, style of business, which is great. This is why I love small businesses like this because they can give every customer that kind of attention that maybe a larger company can't necessarily. Yeah, I don't want to become the big evil corporation. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but the actually the. Um, the the five unit uh, sixty millimeter oval base tray I made. Um, that's actually a really funny story. Uh, one of my customers ordered um, some trays, and then you know a day after it was his first time ordering. A day after he ordered, he ordered more, and so I messaged him. I'm like, I take it you you know you liked them, and he was you know yeah these are great. Um, they're going to be great for moving my demonettes around. And, you know, I, I was sitting here, my wife, I, I read the thing to her. She helps me with the business. Um, and I mentioned demonettes and she had a little, you know, basically a little girl freak out because she plays Slanesh. So she, because he plays Slanesh, she made me make those tray, make one of those trays for him and send it to him for free. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story <laughs> and so, so it does show that if uh, you play a similar faction as you know the guy making the stuff or someone related to the guy making the stuff you can definitely leverage that to your success as well especially with my wife apparently <laughs> <laughs> well it helps her out too because now she has some moving trays for her uh, units and yeah. things like that so that's definitely a positive there um, so kind of moving a little bit from the trays I'm going to put on screen right now and people will see us in a few seconds. There's a bit of a delay. Um, but it also shows a couple different styles of deep strike rulers and then the engagement rulers. 
And what's the what's kind of the benefit of those different types of heads on the deep strike ruler? Um, well, the different deep strike rulers, like a lot of my stuff comes from customer feedback. So I'm, I originally made the large deep strike ruler. And then, you know, people are like, yeah, but what do I do if I'm in tight terrain? Well, let's make the top smaller. Now it'll work in tight terrain. And then um, the, in, the the engagement ruler, I think I might have changed the name to a fight ruler for specifically what it is, uh, which would be the one on the right. Um, that one is, you know, the the width of the base of that is, you know, an inch. So it'll give you engagement range. The length of it and the height of it actually came from, again, customer feedback. And you, this is one of my regular customers. Um, he, uh, the original design of it, the ends were completely rounded like circular. And he mentioned it being three inches and that being um, cohesion. And I said, oh, yeah, it does do that. And he requested that I design it with a more square for easier measurement. So I redesigned it. And then he was talking about, you know, now we got to do is get something for five inches to measure vertical engagement. Well, at the time when I designed it, I designed it for just convenience of ease to move around and, you know, slide it in between models without having to push them around too much. Um, the height of the the tool from the table to the top of the stick was about 5.2 millimeters or 5.2 inches. Um, so all I did when I did the redesign, I said, oh, look, I, the stick's now lower. The stick is five inches from the table to the top. And so now, you know, we have three devices here or one device that'll give you your three different measurements. So it'll cover your regular engagement range. It'll cover your cohesion movement or consolidation sorry your consolidation movement and it'll cover if you need to check for vertical engagement range see that's pretty cool i didn't even see that the first time and then when i was looking at it on your um Etsy store i saw oh wait a minute this isn't just a one inch metering tool it measures one inch three inches and five inches which like you said gives you all of those different factors of engagement range cohesion plus uh heroic intervention as well uh, consolidation uh, not cohesion i'm actually oh yeah, Right. Thinking of redesigning it a little bit to put um, to cover cohesion. Just you know, one thing you don't have to carry a ton of different tools to measure those three. Um, but I'm actually thinking of putting a two inch measurement at the top of it. Mm -hmm. So you flip it over, it'll give you two in two inches for your cohesion. Uh, okay, so like uh, almost like a barbell kind of thing. Kind of. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah. I'll give you all all of those different measurements. So yeah, I'm, that, I'm just gonna on the top of it. It's uh, in my head. I have it being more low profile, just uh, instead of being wide like that, more thin, just for the sake of not having this big blocky tool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely more versatile than I thought at the beginning. And um, it's something I'm looking forward to trying out just to see how easy it is um, or how much easier it makes the game go. Because obviously those are all kind of things that we all do, but then we realize at times that, yeah, there's probably an easier way of doing this. And this seems like it expedites a lot of this, especially the bases with, you know, now Skitari coming in 20-man blocks and <laughs> I don't want to move 20 models individually. That's that's a big thing for me there. Yeah, and I I think we mentioned that at one point before about, you know, 20 man and I don't know someone had asked me before about making a 20 man uh tray uh I I don't see myself doing that I might just put one up there for the people that want it but it's not something I recommend um you know if I get more requests for it I'll make one but because what's going to happen is you know as your models die you're going to be taking them off and then you're going to have this enormous tray, which is just going to look like a bunch of dots. Just like, okay, look, all I have to do is count the dots to see how much I'm losing. So um, it can be easier to just use, you know, multiple of the smaller trays um, in order to achieve, you know, you get a 10 man block of the 25 millimeters. That's not so bad. 
I use those for my Gretchen. Um, but you get a 20, that's a, that's just a big tray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine even just lifting it uh, by the models would be probably near impossible. I, yeah, I wouldn't. You can push them probably, um, but lifting them, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Have you considered maybe, um, not necessarily making a 20 man tray, but maybe making, getting a really thin piece of uh, sheet metal or something like that so you can kind of interlock the trays? Uh, that's actually something I could do. Um, I'd have to get something to cut the sheet metal, though. Um, you know, I have, I'm a mechanic by trade. Hmm. Like, I fix cars. Um, so I have tools that I could do it with, but as for doing it precision so it looks good, um, I, I don't think I have anything. I, I don't, that's not in my capability just yet. Um, but that actually, that's actually a really good idea. Yeah, the reason uh, I actually thought of that was because a question came through um, from Pyro again, because he was asking about gene sealer cults, and he was talking about the bike units with that big ATV in the back. Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, that's like, what, what are they again, 60 millimeter ovals, and then uh, whatever the ATV is. So it's this random, it's kind of like that Admech assortment of bases. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, let's say the bikes get exploded, or the ATV gets exploded, it becomes really weird. But if you put something underneath it uh, to interlock it, sort of like that tray, uh, that metal sheet, um, you can all of a sudden just have that individual ATV base for transport or individual use. And then um, the extra bikers, the Adelin Jackals, I think they're called, in the front mm -hmm. on those bikes. And you can kind of set them up in different orientations. Uh, so it's just kind of like, well, it's the easiest way of getting that solution. But it's definitely a, um, not the easiest thing to cut sheet metal. <laughs> I've had to do it before. So. No. In order to do that with any precision, I need to get a CNC machine, which unfortunately right now is not within my budget. Hopefully in the future I get to the point where, you know, because I, I have plans to expand. I just have to have the budget to expand. So, um, and again, very new. But, you know, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from people. And, you know, everybody who's gotten them seems to like them a lot. Um, I, you know, I've been sending out samples of them to people who order other things just so they can try them out. Um, I actually had one guy who I, I felt bad, but he ordered a set of the basic movement trays and I'd sent a sample one of the magnetic ones with those. And, you know, he got 10 of the basic ones. His package got delivered the next day. He ordered 10 of the magnetic ones. So people like them and I, I, I use them. I like them. So I, if I didn't, if it wasn't something I would use or I didn't like, I, I don't think I'd sell it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they seem super convenient. I actually place an order for um, a little bit of everything just to try it out and see how it works out for me. And um, I think it's probably going to become standard practice for me, at least for uh, the magnetic bases. Um, because again, 20, 20 man units of Skitari are never fun uh, to move by themselves. Um, I play orcs. I play orcs. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to move I, I'm, I'm units. The, oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm the guy that'll put down uh, ninety orcs and ninety Gretchen just to be that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what is just off on a tangent? What does your <laughs> normal orc army look like when you set up for a game? Um. Typically, my normal orc army, uh, it, it consists of three units of boys, um, then two to three shock attack guns, because yeah, they're really random, but when they hit good, they hit really good. Um, uh, my war boss, of course, um, uh, pain boy, um, knob with wah banner. Uh, I typically, I'll be honest with you, stay away from most of the vehicles so far. Uh, I, I've never, just in my games, I've never had great luck trying to go vehicle heavy. I, I always just end up getting completely destroyed. Uh, but my, my staple vehicle has to be the uh, battle wagon as a bone breaker because it's just a beast of a vehicle. Um, and then... You know, of course, you have to have some mech guns because everyone hates the mech guns. And if the your people you play don't like them, that means you really should put them on the board. 
Um, and then typically with that, I fill it out with Gretchkin. And uh, let me think here. Well, I know I'm missing some things. Uh, of course, you have to have some Lutas in there. And yeah, then a little, bit of a, a little bit of everything there. Kind oh yeah, bottles. that's one of the that's oh. that's one of the reasons I love playing the orcs is uh, they can be whatever you need them to be. As, as long as you have the models for them, you can be an up close army. You can be a shooty army orc style. You're, you're going to miss a lot. Um, you can play a vehicle army. Um, there's just so much variety. I mean, no, you can't pair them with anything else. And then, of course, the models, for the most part, tend to be kind of silly, um, which 100% fits my personality. I mean, the the picture you have up, um, those the boys I painted, uh, I, I painted them like the Joker's gang for Batman. Let's see if I can get, yeah, I think I saw that a little bit, the uh, kind of clown yeah, face there. Yeah. Yeah, the clown face, the purple and the orange as the kind of theme I was going for it. I'm really bad about, you know, uh getting my models painted. <laughs> um I, I'm I'm a little overly critical on that. So I'll, I'll I take a long time. Uh, so I'm slowly working through them. Um I got about three thousand points right now with about 200 painted <laughs> so oh, i'm not paint. doing yeah so and then of course because i like the green it took me nine months to come up with the orc skin to get it just right how i wanted it but then of course i have sitting on my shelf because i like the models um i, I got uh some glue spike gets from age of sigmar mm-hmm. um one I, I like the models too um just for fun, because I like the squig models, I'm going to substitute those in for some of my Gretchkin, because, you know, base size, mm-hmm. eh, it'll work. And if you look at the models, you know, there's a Gretchkin in one of them. It's in the mouth of the squig, <laughs> but it's in the, it's, it's there. I mean, they're all ankle <laughs> so, buggers. Yeah. So, yeah, it just works are fun to play. And, you know, it's one of those armies that you can't take too seriously. Um because everything tends to be so random. Uh, so it's just, you, I guess to play orcs, you have to have the orc mentality. You're there to fight. It doesn't matter if you win. <laughs> and how would you say that orc mentality? Was that was orc mentality part of why you kind of got into creating all these things and all these like gadgets and things like that? I, I like solving problems. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm a mechanic by trade. My job is to look at something, figure out what's wrong with it, fix it. Um, so I kind of transfer that mentality, you know, into things. So someone expresses a problem or a, something they want, my mind starts ticking. It says, okay, problem. What can I do to solve it? Solve problem. And, you know, like I said, that's basically what my process was when I was, you know, coming up with the trays was to, you know, what isn't available? What are they doing wrong? How can I fix it? And that's how I came up with what I have. Um, unfortunately, I can't make them completely invisible. Um, now, I could do like the deep strike rulers, of course. I can make them invisible for orcs. I just have to print them in purple. Um, which, uh, that the, the purple deep strike ruler as listed, is very popular. <laughs> um, yes, so, in this regular listing for it, you can select purple as a color, but the invisible listing <laughs> has become very popular. Hmm. Um, so. Oh, I get it, because orcs think purple is invisible, right? Uh, well, no. The orcs don't actually, in the lore, orcs don't think purple is invisible. It's more of a meme. Um, <laughs> the The meme is, you know, because you know orcs in their colors you know red is faster yellow is just better overall it does more damage uh blue is lucky uh the meme is purple must be the sneakiest color because have you ever seen seen a purple orc (laughs) it's true so and of course since that meme there's purple orcs everywhere but i still haven't seen them (laughs) 
Yeah, definitely. Because I was looking at that, I'm like, what makes it invisible? Is it first maybe it's transparent? Maybe it's that? I'm staring at it. I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm just like... No, that's that, <laughs> that's a special listing just for Orc players. Only Orcs, <laughs> Orc players will understand. That makes a lot more sense now. I thought it might have just been like, in a certain like, light condition, it's hard to see or something. I just No, it's absolutely just bright purple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the other cool thing is um, you have the different colors. I think I went with green for the Deep Strike one because, you know, uh, green means go and then red for right. the or was it red i, for, I forgot or yeah, wanted you, red one in green you, and... you 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 ordered red for the uh fight roller and green for the deep strike rollers okay. i know this because i had to switch colors just for those because i didn't have people don't order a lot of green and i hadn't once sold a red uh fight roller so i had to switch colors just for those uh they and just just for your peace of mind uh they will be going in the mail on monday <laughs> Okay, awesome. Yeah, how long? How long is normally the turnaround on those anyway? Because I didn't really look at that. I just kind of said I just um, want these. For me, it didn't matter. But let's say someone's trying to get these in a rush or something like that. The turnaround is. I'm, I give myself a week. I try to get them out as soon as possible. It just depends on my order volume. Um, I, when I, you know, about a month ago, I had one printer. Uh, my order volume got really high, so I bought two more. Um. So it, it's helping me keep up a lot better. Um, but I, I give myself a week. Usually I get them out within, depends on what I have already made up. If, if it's already made up, it's going out next day. Um, but usually my it, it hits the mail box within a day or two. Um, if my order volume gets really high, it's going to put me behind, which is why I give myself a week. And then of course you have however long the post office is going to take. Okay. So pretty, pretty quick turnaround time. And if someone needs, do you offer expedited shipping? If someone wants to request it and pay for the, um, overnight or something like that, if they need it ASAP. I, I believe I do. Um, let me double check that for you real quick. Or at the very worst, I or, can't or, remember. At the very worst, let's say someone just sends you an email and says, "Hey, can I pay you extra?" Oh, if so, yeah, if somebody wants to do that, I can definitely do that. Uh, but yeah. and let's say um, the other question would be: Let's say someone wants one of those unique ones because you said you do custom ones. Roughly, yeah. if you had to give an estimate, obviously it's going to be different for each style because each base is going to have its own complexity. But roughly, how long for like a custom order would you say is the average? Um, time from request payment or whatever and then creation what would you say like the time frame of that is um the time frame on that um if i already have the design to fit the base of the model if, I've, if i'm already done with that um i can get the design done in a day or two um again it just depends how busy i am um i'll do my best to get it done the same you know within a day but i gotta what I got to do is I have to design it, print it, make sure it comes out right um, because I've had them not quite come out right. And then when it's right, I'll ship it. So, uh, in all honesty, it might add a day to your total time before you receive the item. So. Oh, wow, that's surprisingly quick. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, right, right now, again, if my volume, like I, I'm, I'm doing all right right now, better than I thought I'd be by leaps and bounds, um, especially this fast. Um, it just depends on where my order volume is at the time. So, how busy am I? How many requests have I gotten? Um, if I've gotten a lot of requests for custom shapes or custom formations, then that's going to put me back. If I'm just sitting on a whole bunch of orders and I'm waiting on my printers to do their thing, then I have time to devote to that. So again, turn around. It just right now it's me, my wife and my garage. So yeah, right now it just, it, everything time is dependent on volume. I'm doing my best to get everything out as fast as possible. Um, I haven't had any problems so far getting anything out within my time frame. Um, at the beginning of the month, when I first posted the Deep Strike Roller, and when I posted it, I was just literally just asking people for their opinion on it. Um, I didn't even have it for sale. Uh, I ended up putting it for sale, for sale that night because of the response I got from it. Um, 
that week when I put that up there, that was incredibly stressful because I had so many orders. I had one printer and I'm trying to get everybody, everything on time. Um, and then I found that my original design for the deep strike ruler, the measurements were right, but remember how I mentioned shrinkage? Yeah. Um, it ended up being about three millimeters too short. So I had this big stack of rulers that I hadn't sent out yet, and I'd spent days printing up, and they were all bad. I, I you know, it, yes, it's only like three millimeters, but it wasn't right. So I had to go through and do a quick redesign of it and just like mass print them as fast as I could. So oh, um, I didn't I didn't do a lot of sleep in that week just so I could get everything switched over. So you know, it it takes several hours to print one of them. Um, so I had to be up to switch the printer. Just I, I managed to get everything out on time, but the stress level was actually really high because I, I, I didn't want anybody's things to be late. I, you know, I promised something by a certain time. I want you to have it by when I promised it. So <laughs> no, that's, that's very good of you. I mean, that's very valiant again, showing just the customer focused nature of the business. And um, so what happened with those rulers, the ones that were off, were they just scrapped or just um, out of curiosity? I, <laughs> uh, me and my daughter went to the park and threw them as boomerangs until they hit the ground and shattered. They actually kind of come back. <laughs> Depends on how you throw them. <laughs> so these, these so we had fun with boomerangs them. in an emergency is what you're saying? Yeah, in an emergency, you could probably, you know, take down a kangaroo or something. <laughs> <laughs> they're real down under i mean <laughs> to be fair warhammer <laughs> super popular in australia so um actually speaking of which uh what what where do you ship to what kind of just just so people have an idea of what your shipping uh, policies are and everything because we're on kind of on the top uh shipping um most of my orders are in the u.s because the shipping's cheaper that's just how it is uh i if you order i i'd love to give free shipping to everybody um but because of how much it cost me to make them, the magnets being the predominant expense in putting them out, um, I can't give free shipping. Um, I offer free shipping if you go over thirty-five dollars. There's enough there if you're over thirty-five dollars in the U.S. for me to just eat the free ship, eat the shipping. Most of my orders come out to about, you know, three fifty to four dollars in shipping if you're under that. Um, now, international orders, I will send international. Uh, just I don't get a lot because, one, people don't know if my s stuff is good because they haven't had it in their hands. Once they have it in their hands, then they know. Um, so international shipping runs, you know, 15 to $18 typically. I mean, if you order a lot of stuff, it's going to get more. But um, so... What I do with international, if you hit $55 in your order, um, there's enough there where I will swallow the cost of the shipping just because I want you to have, you know, my stuff. Um, it's, like I said, it's good. It's quality. And when you, and when you say international, do you mean um, Europe or does that include Canada or wh where's the boundary of that? Because... Um... I don't know if it's different shipping for Canada and the U.S. versus shipping to U.S. and England, let's say, or something of that nature. I'm sure. Um, yeah, there's obviously a difference. But... The way the post office does it, it's kind of a general rate international. So there's a small variance in distance, um, but you know, if I ship to Canada, the shipping's about fifteen dollars. If I'm shipping to the U.K., it's about fifteen to eighteen. It just kind of depends on that one. Um, I haven't shipped anything to Australia, so I really don't know how much it's going to cost to ship there. Uh, but from what I've seen so far of the post office, their international shipping rates are fairly standard. Um, and they don't charge too much more for distance. So it's just one of those. It's Everything's based on weight and size. On I think it just has to go with, we got planes going over there anyway, let's fill them. So... Hmm. Um, yeah, it seems to be pretty standard shipping rate from my experience so far. Um, 
Okay. I mean, that makes sense. And that, that does give some credence to some people, though, if let's say they want to buy something um, in Canada, for example, because I know some of my viewers are from there. It might be a good idea for them to get a couple of friends to look at the product as well and say, hey, yeah, let's all if, order together and get the free yeah, shipping. Yeah, that'll, that'll save you a ton. If, if you have a group ordering like that, even here in the U.S., that'll save you a ton on shipping if you just do it in one big bulk order. Um, because, again, how they do it, it's based on size and weight. So um, it goes up like here in the U.S., you know. If it's under four ounce, if it's four ounces or under, it's this much. If it's up to, I think, eight or nine ounces, it goes up a little, little bit, or it goes up again. Um, but I could fit a lot in those ounces, um, just because you know my it, it doesn't weigh a lot. The stuff I I, I sell, um, a, a lot of magnet trays will go up in weight because well, magnets are made of metal. Um, so. But yeah, if if you have a bunch of people that want to get together and make a you know a larger order, you can save a ton on shipping, especially if you're international. Yeah, so get your friends involved, get your friends to get some of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> or you know, um, let's say you get one thing just to see how how it is and how it feels before you order more. Then go to your friends and say, "Hey, look at this thing," and now they can feel it in their hands and see it and play with it and understand what they would be getting uh, in turn, and that gives them a good way of judging the quality of it directly instead of having to kind of guess um so yeah. you can be an ambassador in that sense and, well it, yeah with oh. with having it in your hands uh i when i sell trays i actually send a couple extra magnets i can't send a lot just because the cost of them mm -hmm. um because the reason i send the extra magnets is i'll be honest with you uh they're going to come in a stack and they're all going to be attached to each other because well magnets um so what's going to happen is, from my experience with people and myself, the worst offender, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take that stack and you're just going to start playing with it. You're going to start spinning it around and see them because they'll pull together. And what's going to happen is um, at some point they're going to you're going to move it. It's going to slip and one of the magnets are going to fall. And you got about 30 percent chance that the carpet goblins are going to eat the magnet. <laughs> and then you'll be down a magnet. So I send a couple extra for, you know, when you lose them. It's very, so. very uh, forward thinking because even right now I'm just sitting here <laughs> playing with a stack of magnets that I have for my models. So. Yeah, you, can, you can't help but play <laughs> with magnets. That's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I like using the magnets. Magnets are just fun by themselves. It's like, uh, it's science, but it, it in your hands it feels like magic. <laughs> definitely and uh, a question came through and I, I don't know if this means something to orc players that doesn't necessarily mean to me it says ask him who the greenest orc is okay that was not a orc accent but <laughs> I did my best <laughs> the greenest orc I have I have not heard about the greenest orc the, the greenest orc I don't know uh, <laughs> alright all right, I'm, I'm watching the chat right now fill me in who's the greenest orc <laughs> Yeah, it takes a few minutes to hear us, but... Um, yeah, there's a lag. Yeah. Speaking of works, did you see the new um, previews for the Beast Naga guys? I, yeah, I, the the day I saw them, I messaged in my uh, local shop's uh, Facebook channel, you will get me these. <laughs> I can imagine, especially and, uh, watching the squigs, and now they have the great white squig or whatever it is. Uh, I know. I Game Workshop trying to kill my wallet. Like... <laughs> It's it's bad, um, but no, my local shop. Um, I I'm trying to set up an arrangement for them to where um, they can sell my stuff through their shop, and I can get store credit to feed my habit. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really cool. That's always a good yeah. way of uh, bartering with things. It's kind of a win-win situation and everything of that. Nature. Oh, it Gaz is the greenest. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, Gazgol Thraka. Dude, that's a yeah. really cool model. I won't lie, I love Orc I, models. It is. So. I yeah. I, I I got Gasgol uh the the day he hit the store. So that was another one of those. I went I went in the store. I'm like, you will get me this. Um, <laughs> Dude, he's huge too. That's the other thing. Is it just oh man? Uh, I I I've was he the same? Is he the same one from uh, the Armageddon campaigns and Commissar Yarek and everything? Ah, uh, the Armageddon that, campaigns. I don't or is that know. Different Gasgol. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've I've been playing for about a year. Uh, okay, 
So yes. there's there's a lot um, I'm absent on. Uh, you know, I've listened to a lot of the lore. <laughs> um, my brother has me beat by leaps and bounds, and so <laughs> does my friend. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, on my, on my brother's note, he is the um, I use him as my baseline for army design. <laughs> um, he's how I figured out if you know this is a good list because um, the more pissed he gets while we're playing the better I know my list is. <laughs> That's how you know you're doing it right, is <laughs> less friends you make, the better off you are. Um, have you have you done any tournaments in that year time, or do you plan to do any tournaments or anything of that nature? Um, I, I want to get my army painted first, so if I figure out, you know, um, probably at the rate I'm going, I'll get into a tournament by like 2056 or so. <laughs> yeah, it's uh you know it'll be a few additions between then and now but <laughs> <laughs> you know we'll probably have a very different orc looking army by then <laughs> yeah you know, that's you know it's I, I always recommend people try out tournaments but i also understand at the same time it's not for everyone and you know there's obviously different kinds and that's one thing i always try to do with this podcast to get people from different walks of the hobby to kind of you know share their story and everything and uh, when I saw you posted uh, your products in the Admic form, I said, I'm, I posted like, hey, can you tell me a story? And you kind of told me about it a bit. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. I really want this guy on the show just to have him tell other people. Because I think that's one thing people don't always realize is that they don't always see the person behind the product and kind of their story and everything else. And I think that's a big, a big part of what gets people interested in a product as well as kind of that story. Yeah, I'm just a guy. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just the guy. Um, I'm, I'm not some CEO. Uh, I don't wear a suit. Uh, I just, I, I fix cars. I am way too addicted to Warhammer. Uh, my wife hollers at me about it all the time. <laughs> uh, and then I buy her some Slaness and she, you know, shuts up about it and smiles. And then <laughs> I think that's her ploy to get more models. Um, and you know, I make things to make the game a little bit easier. That's definitely a great story, you know. Um, I guess you know you mentioned you started with one three D printer. You're up to three three uh, D printers, I believe, at this point. Yeah, I'm at three. Yeah. So what's what's kind of your future plans for this, and where do you see yourself kind of going with this? Um, that's uh, another thing that always interesting to hear where someone expanding and things like this because obviously this is gaining popularity gaining traction um well i want to get some more machinery um because there's other things i want to do or different ways i want to do things um so the very top of my list on machinery i want to get and it unfortunately it's a really expensive investment um i'd like to get a laser cutter so that um one if like the day i get the laser cutter and I get it working right because I'm going to have to learn how to use it. I mean, everything I've done has just been a learning experience. Um, when I when I went to have to do the, you know, I had the 3D printer. I was just making stuff other people printed when I first got it or other people made, you know, picking up game pieces off a of Thingiverse, making them up. We used them in our board games. Um, well, when it came time for me to, you know, oh, crap, I need to make some extra money now. Um, Basically, I got Fusion 360. I paid the money to use it because it's not free anymore. Um, and I just had—I I had no idea how to use it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I just, you know, within a week, just crammed as much as I could into my head. So when I get that laser cutter, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. Um, so I'm going to ha learn have have to learn how to make that work. Uh, but what I want to do, <clears throat> like, so when I get that working, the deep strike rollers they're going to kick over to acrylic um, for a couple of reasons. One, I'll be able to produce them faster. Uh, it will cost me more on my end to make them because of the cost of the materials, but they'll look better. Uh, I'll be able to, be, with the laser cutter, I'll be able to etch things into them. I've had uh, a couple stores uh, request that, you know, can I get them some for their stock and etch their store logo into them one way or another can can you know can they sell them branded for their store 
uh, I can't do that with the equipment I have right now. Um, and, you know, I want to make with that, I want to, you know, make custom dice. Uh, and of course, first thing on my mind is, uh, you know, oh, what the six sided die or the six on the dice. You, you're shooting an extra shot because orcs and their daka 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 roll. Um, so I want to do that. And then there's some other stuff I want to make with that. Um, of course, I want to get uh, on top of that. I want to get the CNC machine, especially now since you mentioned the idea of using a thin piece of sheet metal to combine the trays together into kind of a thing. Now, I mean, yes, it'll be um, it'll make the trays a little wobbly. They won't be flush to the table because there's more material underneath. Um, but it will do a job that needs done uh, because I w I've been trying to figure out how to make units be able to be a, uh, a movable blob to where they're not in fixed positions. But every solution I come up with is, you know, adding several millimeters to the height of the model. And, you know, that's not a great idea um, because the higher you push the model up in the air, the worse they are hiding behind walls and stuff and it just makes you more visible um <clears throat> then of course you know get the more equipment and then you know i just keep growing keep getting you know my name out there is offering a you know a good product that doesn't do what other people do you know it fits the needs that aren't being filled um and then, you know, obviously I want to try to keep my prices as reasonable as possible. Um, if, if you look around at the other movement trays and you look at the prices of the other movement trays that they have available, um, I'm either at their price range, below their price range, or slightly over, but you're getting so much more. Um, yeah, that's just one depends thing. on... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say that was one huge thing I noticed because I was looking at your procs. I'm like, what can you really get in Warhammer for three dollars an item? There really isn't much, and yeah, you know, your magnet trays and everything are about three dollars for a five man unit. I was like, that'd be crazy not to buy some of this stuff in a lot of cases. I, well, I I think Games Work Workshop sells dice for three dollars a piece. <laughs> Oh, so, yeah, I bought a deck of cards for twenty five dollars <laughs> from them. So, <laughs> um, and then of course you know, make sure I don't become the quote unquote evil corporation um, through all of this. Uh, so, I mean, one day it might be nice to be able to produce the trays, you know, injection molded, but that's way way down the road. Because, you know, injection molds can cost anywhere from, um, you know, three to $10,000 for one mold. And I'd have to have a mold for each layout of models. So that's just completely impractical. <laughs> um, you know, it let me produce them faster and cheaper in the long run, but the upfront cost is just absurd. Um, yeah, you really need to be doing a big volume to go into injection molding and things like that, from my experience. Yeah, that that's what injection molding is for—is for huge volume. Um, so if I hit the point where I have that volume, you know, and you know, the company's making you know a ton of money to where I can afford it, um, then that'd be great. I mean, where we're at right now, um, my wife has to take off work for the summer because we have little kids. Um, so where we're at right now, and that's one of the things we were trying to fill with the oh crap, we have to move was you know making up for her income and uh, so where we're at right now we're about making up for her income um so that makes you know it's it's helping quite a bit um there there's a lot more cost involved in doing this than i thought uh facebook and google are just completely annihilating me on their ads <laughs> Jeez. so you've, you've taken uh, well, out some ads on these already or yeah, uh, I put out Facebook ads. That's gotten me a lot of attention. Um, that's helped drive up my traffic a little bit. Um, now, I just recently tried putting up some Google ads. I think it actually last night I tried putting up some Google ads. Um, I actually had to shut those down because um, 
I, again, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm a, I'm a mechanic. Uh, I'm probably doing something wrong somewhere, but you know, they're charging me, you know, over a dollar per click. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah so, and right. you know, if I was, if I was selling, you know, three, four, five hundred dollar items, um, I can see where that'd be, you know, reasonable. But you know, my like you said, my things are three dollars. Um, so, um, and yeah, then you know you have you have conversion, yeah, you have conversion rate off of that, which is you know the average. You're looking, you know, one to five percent of people who click on your stuff's going to buy something. Um, so that's just completely impractical. So you know, I'm, I'm paying with them. I'm paying over if I was doing it that way. I'm paying over a hundred dollars for three sales. Ooh, geez, that's yeah, that's crazy. I didn't know that because to give you some uh, uh, insight into how like a YouTuber gets um, any exposure to ads uh, per thousand views or something like that, and I'm assuming there's probably they have some formula for clicks. You know, a YouTubers probably were earning like ten bucks per thousand views or something like that. Um, Twenty bucks on the high end. Well, not a YouTuber. So what it is is what they do is they have a CPM and an RPM. The CPM mm-hmm. is the total brought in for those thousand views, and that has to be a thousand views without ad block, for example. So it could be two thousand views or three thousand views that get you those thousand ad views, but then YouTube takes their cut. So realistically, most YouTubers, especially in the gaming space, are earning like uh, two to four or five dollars uh, per thousand ad views. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like, wow, a dollar a click is <laughs> kind of unimaginable. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what they charge for the ad views because um, the system that I went through, just the Google ad system, they don't charge for impressions, which oh, is just, okay. you know, someone, someone sees it, but they charge you when they click on it. Huh. So what you get, so Facebook is good for getting noticed. Okay. So it's going to take someone, it's going to find someone who has this interest. So in my case, Warhammer, who's interested in Warhammer and it's going to show my things to them. Um, and I pay for... Uh, being th- them seeing it and then you know it, it, it tells me about how much my clicks cost through facebook so you, this many people saw it this many people uh clicked it this is how much you're paying per click uh going through google ads um as i understand it because again i uh it shows your ads to people who are looking for what you have so facebook is good for getting noticed in general um the google ads is good for getting people who are looking for something that you that you make um to help them find it well find you um unfortunately the price they're charging for it is just not something i can afford right now yeah it seems very unreasonable (laughs) at that price um you know and, and obviously there's different ways of advertising um I'm always, I never know how impactful Google ads and things like that are, obviously, because, um, you know, you don't get a, you don't necessarily get to see the results right away um, versus something where you actually see direct feedback. I guess, I guess if you have like an affiliate link or something, you can monitor it directly because, um, you know, who's bringing you the traffic and things of that nature, but you're also only paying out to the people bringing you that traffic that converts into sales. Um, so, like, Etsy, I advertise on Etsy too, and all that really does is just put me on top of the search list. So, you know, you search for movement tray on Etsy, you'll see the stuff and it'll say, you know, it'll say add next to the ones towards the top. Um, so that gets me pushed up to the top of the list. Um, that I can track directly because, you know, this much I spend and then they let me know if something, someone bought something off of an ad. Um, so that I can track. Um, oh, okay. You know, yeah. So now with Google and Facebook, I mean, it'll tell me they came from Google or Facebook, but it doesn't tell me if they bought it from because of Google or Facebook. Yeah, that that seems like the hardest thing about it is that, sure, you might be getting those clicks and you're paying for those clicks, but it doesn't guarantee someone buys it. And what happens in the event of someone just clicking, because, you know, I, I'll every now and then I have ad blocker on, obviously, but every now and then I disable it just to see things because sometimes I'll discover something interesting by seeing a, ad, a YouTube ad or something like that. Uh, there was one recently I found that was some kind of eBay alternative for collectibles that you can just like bid on and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, like very rarely do I buy something when I click on one of those ads. A lot of times it's just like, oh, this is cool. I'll put it in the back of my head. 
So I can imagine if you're paying per click, that gets very expensive and prohibitive, and you might not actually be gaining anything out of it either. Right. Um, and, um, I guess what what other kind of avenues? I'm just kind of curious in this uh, chain of thought. What, what other kind of avenues have you considered in terms of advertising, things like that? Because I can imagine something like those deep strike rulers. Um, you know, if you can get them low enough, once you get the cutter and everything, you can potentially, like you were saying, etch logos into it. And even as like at conventions, people can give out. You know how they give out little goodie bags and things like that. Some of these yeah. kind of items. Um. Uh, yeah, that's already kind of been on my kind of to goal list is you know being a participant at you know conventions and things um i I live in ohio uh ohio has origins game fair um so you know we we weren't in a position to it it just ended uh we weren't in a position to do anything but you know uh, me and my wife we like going there just in general um, so we'll, if we keep going the way we're going, uh, we're looking at, um, possibly doing a thing there. Um, now I guess it's more board game centric, but I'm sure there's going to be Warhammer players there. Um, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, looking about possibly getting a booth there. I, I don't know how much they cost. They're, I'm they're have expensive. to look it up closer. I'm sure they're expensive. Yeah. Um, they're, uh... every, every, yeah, I'm, I'm finding out that everything is expensive. Well, the other thing you have to watch out for, yeah, life life gets really expensive. So I used to work in conventions and things like that. Um, one thing you want to watch out for is they also charge for everything, including chairs. So they'll charge you like $50 a chair if you don't bring your own and stuff like that. Oh, Tables, chairs, uh, internet. Now. Yeah, so anything you can kind of source yourself. And sometimes they'll keep you from bringing anything from the outside. Uh, but I know like especially where I am, convention centers are ridiculous. So like a uh, 10 by 10 booth, um, you know, like the BCEC or something like that where PAX is held or PAX East, I guess. Uh, whew, it's like $10,000 just to start off. And then, you know, by the time you buy internet chairs, et cetera, and you're probably getting convention food for every year staffing, uh, they get insanely expensive. But but if you have the product to sell, because um, uh, we did board games and stuff like that at PAX East when I worked there. Uh, you can make that money back, but uh, the other thing is a lot of people do, if they have their own gaming store, they'll go there to buy individual cards and things like that so that they can restock their inventory back in their game store. But obviously that's different if you're just selling a product, for example, that you don't have that kind of resale business. Okay. Yeah. Um. But it's definitely something interesting. I mean, um, I love working conventions. It's it's a great experience if you ever can do it. Um one thing I can suggest also is I've seen people do this where they have multiple participants within one booth because a lot of times you'll have businesses that have a small array of products and this used to happen with I think Anime Boston uh, the most because their prices were a little lower um, for a booth and you would have booths with like four or five artists for example uh, selling their different products and they would just kind of each pitch in a certain amount depending on how much floor space they take up and then you know, they would sell their individual products and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. Good to know. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not completely alone in what I'm doing. Um, I have uh, like one of my first customers, um, really good guy, and ended up talking to him. He lives here in the Ohio with me. Um, he actually works at an advertising, a small advertising agency. So he been giving me a lot of advice and kind of helping me direct myself. Um, because, and I will honestly say without him, I'd still be fumbling around with a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's lucky me. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, you know, I, when I'm able and when they're interested, I do like to interact with my customers. Um, just you know, how do how do I know what people want? How do I know what people like? How do I know what I can do better? Um, unless you know, they tell me. Um, because you know, I can have my thing. I can have my rose colored glasses on, and look at my thing and say, "Oh, it's most most amazing thing ever." But you know, when I put it in someone else's hands and they say, "Oh, these are amazing," then you know, you know, your thoughts are confirmed. Yeah, if that for makes sure. sense. No, for sure. And I mean, sometimes, again, as a, as a creator, 
a lot of times I know the biggest trap we can fall into or uh, anyone who creates anything can fall into is they over-focus on something that might not be as important to the consumer or the end user. Um, so it's definitely important to have that interaction. Speaking of which, where is the email the easiest way to reach you for anyone who wants to kind of get a hold of you and talk about products or anything like that? Or is there... Um, you, can, you can get to me through the email or you can message me directly from my Etsy store. Hmm. Um, there, there should be a button on the main page of my Etsy store that, you know, give you an option to message me. And, you know, I check my messages, you know, they bing on my phone. So generally, unless I'm asleep or I'm in the middle of working, uh, I can get back to you rather quickly. So. Awesome. And I guess, cause you also mentioned you're a big board gamer. Are you willing to work on products outside of 40 K or are you mostly? I, I absolutely want to. Okay. I absolutely want to. Um, now, the problem with that um, has to do with equipment right now. So, say one of the popular things, obviously, with the bigger board games is storage inserts into your box to help keep everything organized. Um, I absolutely could do those on my 3D printer. The problem is doing up one of those is going to eat, probably eat up about a day and a half, if not two days of print time. Um, so, like, if you look at, uh, what is it, the company? A Broken Token, I believe, is the company. Uh, they make box inserts and things like that. Uh, they cut them out of MDF. So, you know, it's kind of a thin particle board. Uh, and you assemble, you know, they send it to you. Usually, it's unassembled. And you assemble your box insert from that. Well, when I have the laser cutter, I will be able to produce those. Or things similar. Um, there's a lot of things you can... Again, that laser cutter, once I get that, um, it's going to open up a whole new realm of things I can make. Um, other than that, you know, you get small little pieces to put into, you know, just to help with the games. Um, this is where my, my current uh, employer or my, my day job, um, he puts me to shame when it comes to board games. Um, so he's kind of on the lookout for the next big game coming out because he will have it, I promise you. Uh, so I can kind of go through it, take some measurements, see how the game plays, what can we do to make it better, and uh, so I can make things for that as well. Oh, because, cool. I, yeah, because uh, I, I honestly can't say Especially because with my price, my prices right now are kind of a limiter for me. Hmm. Um, because uh, I have a lot of cost in the product I sell, and I don't want to sell it at an unreasonable price or a price that people aren't willing to pay. Um, so because of that, just if I just were to stick to 40k, I don't think I can build a complete independent company just off 40k um now right now i I honestly believe that the uh movement trades once i get them in enough people's hands and they get enough games in and they get enough people seeing what they have because well i'm the same way um and i think most people are where you get something cool you want to show it off to your other friends who are interested in the things that are you know you're interested in so hopefully, like the biggest thing I can get right now that would be the best help to me would be just word of mouth. Like, look, look at this. It's cool. This is where I got it. Um, do you, so, oh, sorry, good. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, do you send like, um, like little cards with like your Etsy address and everything on them when you ship the orders, or you, or anything of that nature? Um, what I get, what you're gonna get, um. Because if if the order shipped, then um, you've you've found my Etsy store. So I don't really put that on there. Um, but what you're gonna get, you're gonna get a little piece of paper. It's a, it's basically a thank you note. Um, and on that, you know, you're gonna what's gonna be on there. You're gonna have um, the where you can get a hold of me. The the feedback at greasemonkeygames.com. Um, so that if you know if you have any requests or anything else or just something you want to say to me um so you can get a hold of me through there and then what else you're going to get with it um you're going to get some 
basically a picture guided on how to use the movement trays, how to get your models on them. Um, and, you know, right now, uh, everybody gets that picture guidance because uh, I, I'm trying to get these trays in people's hands. So right now, everybody's getting a free sample. Even if you, like, if you don't order trays, you're getting a free sample. You, so you're going to get a tray. Um, it, typically, it's going to be a, if I have, have them available at the time, um, it's just going to be a little three man tray. Um, but yeah, so everybody's going to get instruction, and that's pretty much what comes with it. Um, also, with the uh, with the deep strike rollers, um, just because I don't completely trust the post office, um, it's going to be packed in the package between a couple pieces of thin chipboard. Uh, oh, okay. It's not, yeah, it's not super super sturdy chipboard, uh, but it is still chipboard. The reason I pick chipboard as opposed to like a piece of cardboard is a lot of hobbyists, you know, they use chipboard to make things. That's it's you know they use it in part of the hobby. So you know if I can one package the product to support it because again I don't trust the post office not to break it, um, and two take that packaging I send you. And so that it's something that maybe if this is a part of your part of the hobby you're interested in, you can use that material to make something with, then, you know, it's, it's a win-win. Yeah. See, I think, I think that's very smart. Um, Cause even with cardboard and things like that, I've had, I used to order things like magic, the gathering cards. And as you mentioned, the post office is not the most reliable um, transportation source. So it happened where even with that cardboard, sometimes, it would come ripped in half or damaged or bent um, because, you know, if a mail carrier can, they'll jam it into a mailbox one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so that that chipboard is definitely going to give it a lot more ability to survive (laughs) than the cardboard would. Um, Oh, no, the the worst I've ever gotten. Uh, My wife's mom used to live in Germany. She sent us this big box of stuff. It's just stuff she bought that she wanted us to have, like, you know, little glass things and whatever. Um, and I went to the post office to pick it up because it was a big box. And they handed me this box that looked like someone had spent half a day just kicking it around the floor. <laughs> like it was re- almost everything inside of it was shattered. And when, it, you know, this box is about two and a half feet long, you know, t- a foot and a half to two feet tall and then the same wide. So it's a good size box and yeah, they just annihilated this box and I went, I'm looking at it. I'm like, are you serious right now with this box? <laughs> and the, the person working the counter is just like, I don't know. It's my job to give it to you. <laughs> oh, you can, I, 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 here's the, here's the claim form. <laughs> this is how you cl- file a claim. Cause you should. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I had that happen to me once where I ordered, um, you know, at the time for what I was a college kid, so it was a kind of expensive magic card, and it came in a little baggie that says, sorry, your mail got damaged, and it was literally the envelope ripped in half, uh, like, uh, perfectly, and I was just like, well, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this now? <laughs> like, yeah. you couldn't have ripped it Thanks, more guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, how does that even happen? Like, it looked like someone just grabbed it and tore it in half, like, uh, down the middle. I, I just can't imagine how a machine would do that. <laughs> Well, dealing with the post office is like trying to make a phone call to the IRS. Oh, I mean, <laughs> actually, speaking of the Joker, um, there's an old episode of the old Mark Hamill Joker cartoon or the old Batman cartoon, and the Joker's freaking out, and one of his henchmen says, "Hey, what's wrong, boss?" And he says, "Well, my taxes or something like that." And he says, well, "Why don't you just, you know, ignore it? You're a criminal." And he's like, "I'm not. I'm not that crazy to mess with the IRS." Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But did I bring him back a little bit of PS, PTSD with that, you know, trying to make a phone call to the IRS? He seemed a little, uh, little traumatized there. Uh, it's just any time I have to pay taxes, I'm like, uh, <laughs> how much do I owe you? It's like, oh. Yeah. No, it's um, uh, especially when you're a small business, uh, to anyone who hasn't have, had to own the small business, you get audited a lot. Luckily, I haven't had to deal with it, but um. My stepfather had a taxi business, just a small one where it was just himself, but he would get audited every single year, pretty much, because it was a cash business at the time. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, that had to be miserable. 
Yeah, he, uh, he kind of gave me a rundown of what not to do when you're a small business and things like that. So Yeah, so this is why we don't like the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, <laughs> it's one of the systems, again, uh, they know how much you owe them, but you don't, and you have to guess. And if you get it wrong, yeah. you're in a world of pain. <laughs> once yeah. Why don't you just tell me? You already know. You have everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, going back back to the topic of um, different products and things like that, I guess what what is something you would like to work on if you if you could choose to work on anything? Uh, what would, would be something that you would really want to make in this and with in this kind of field of products? Uh, well, it kind of goes into my problem solving nature. Um, I want to make this thing that's completely impractical. And would because of what it is, it probably cost way too much and honestly would fit needs that nobody has. Um, that's just kind of a I thought about it and I want to I want to make it, but it, it, it definitely won't apply to Warhammer. It might apply to some other games. Just it depends. You know, some maybe some of the historical war games might have something along the lines of it. Um but going along with the okay, if you sleep, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination here a little bit. Uh, so take that deep strike ruler, okay? And I've actually kind of got a prototype of the first part of it. Uh, but make the arms on it removable. Um, mm-hmm. And again, because everybody loves magnets, um, so you have arms that will attach magnetically. So what you got is a modular tool. So the arms attach magnetically. You can take them off. You have various options. Um, So you can switch, you know, say you you only have room to put an arm on one side. Well, now you only have to put an arm on one side. Um, Then, uh, oh, this arm's too long. I have a shorter one. And then going into the completely, you know, well, let me back up a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then, you know, having the actual measuring part of it, um, be able to change the length for to certain situations. So now you have this tool. You can change the length. You can change the configuration of it. Um, and then if going into the completely impractical part of it, I, I part of me wants to, just to see if I can, um, make a um best way to describe it um to where if you take that arm and you can angle it up and basically attach some uh, i can't remember what they're called off the top of my head but think of an arch heading from heading towards the back of the roller Mm-hmm. And, you know, every, say, five degrees, um, what's going on is there's a magnet on each side. So you take these two arches, you attach them to the main body, um, and then you can take that and just tick it up every five degrees. And because there will be magnets in the actual ruler part, uh, they'll it'll lock into place every five degrees or so, um, just so you can measure distances from an angle. Um, again... Before they did the recent rule change, mm-hmm. that was uh, you know you know which rule I'm talking about. I I don't remember it, the one that lets you be able to do a charge from eight less than nine inches. Uh, vaguely, I think I know what you mean. But you're basically trying to do sort of like a protractor that's uh, lockable, yeah, and measurable. Right. right. So before the recent rule change, which was this month, I believe, uh, that would have been a usable thing. Um. But because of how the, you know, the triangle worked and the vertical engagement range versus the triangle length, um, you know, that would have been a reasonable thing to do. But right now, not so much because they killed that rule. And so that idea is kind of on the back burner. Hmm. But I'd still like to make it just to see if I can. A lot of stuff I want to do is just to, can I? Can I do it? Can I make it work? Um, cause you know, doing that at that angle and having that ruler, right. One of the problems that is posed by it, um, uh, is when you start angling that up one, you have to have the back of that ruler attached to something. Um, it has to have a pivot. 
um, well, where's the measurement from that pivot? Because if, for example, I were to put a magnet on the back of it and use a magnet on each side as the pivot, um, and put the rulers, you know, that say nine inches as the default, um, say the ruler's nine inches. Well, when you raise that pivot, the back of that ruler is going to move. So a lot of the problem solving comes in with, you know, how do I get it? So I measure out the ruler from a, a specific point on it that's going to stay at the same position. It, it'll move, but the farthest part will stay at the same position the whole time. Um, and just, yeah, like I said, it's just see if I can do it. Um, and then, of course, you know. If someone says a lot of it, you know, I, I, I look around, you know, what are people asking for? So um, if I see someone asking for something that does a thing, um, can I make that thing? Can I make it do uh, more than what they asked for? Can I make it better? Because a lot of times when someone asks for something, they're not asking for everything they want. They, they're, You know, you have the primary thing you're thinking about that you want. But there might be some other things in there that you also want, but you, you're mainly focused on that primary thing. So can I find that thing that they want? And then can I from that, can I discern what the other things they also want without them saying it? And can I fill that? So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of things probably are, or I guess maybe that's a good question for you. How many things do you find are emergent about the product usage? Because I was just sitting here and I was thinking, well, what if I had uh, one of those trays for this Qatari, right? But I had three fives and a six. And what the six would be is I could take a base, like a normal base, and mm -hmm. write something on it. Let's say like um, data tether or, you know, this. So I could use it like as a marker for what buffs they have. Because obviously, AdMech right now in the um, new codex, your command phase is like half your turn at this point because you're stacking different buffs, you're doing this and that. So I was wondering, I'm like, oh, well, if I get one with an extra little slot, I can have interchangeable base caps, essentially, that don't serve as a unit, but say, okay, these have XYZ buffs, and then I don't have to constantly remind myself, because right now we use dice or little markers or things like that, but it'd be yeah. cool with something that moves with it, or maybe what Forge World they're from, or something of that nature. Um, I've actually kind of been thinking of a solution to that, especially for tracking health. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I have yet to come up with something just yet that what you just kind of came up with is is an idea. Mm -hmm. um, it might be something that I might want to try to refine somehow. And now that I'm thinking about it, I could if OK, um, this is probably bad, but, you know, because someone could hear it and then make it before I do. Um, but. Say, remember when we were talking about the stick to move the stuff around with. Mm -hmm. um, so you take that, you add the part to the mo to the tray. You're, you, you, there's no way around it. You know, you're going to have to add more material to it and make it. You know, basically, you have space that's on the board that's not used space from the position of the gameplay. Uh, so, you know, something's there, but it's not actually there. Um, so you take a little piece, you stick it off the end. Um, and then you have, you know, the slot for the stick because I'd just, again, me being overly critical, that stick's got to come be able to be removed because um, I, I don't, me personally, I don't want to look at a board uh, with sticks sticking up all over the place and because I don't want to look at that, then chances are I'm not going to make it. Um, but take, so you have that and then either A, and I'm, I'm brainstorming as I go here. Um, so what you, we could do with that is use the stick as the tracker. So there wouldn't be a good generic way to do it to where it would be um, out of the box, able to mark, you know, tray for tray or unit for unit. but say a piece of masking tape with something written on it you know this is unit a mm -hmm. and then that stick is designed in such a way to where you 
have a health tractor built into it and a way to track status, little tokens that, and again, we can make it in such a way that it has built in magnets to it or at the top of it, just, you know, a rectangular flag hmm. as the thing you hold on to. And so we can hold all that status on that stick that we use to move the unit around and track it that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, because the one, the one issue with making, let's say, like what I was thinking of where it was like the six space, is that, again, if you're in between terrain, you can potentially run into a situation where you're uh, bumping into things or can't quite fit it in or something of that nature. <laughs> yeah, so that that's actually an idea I may have to work up. Um, so you, you, you may get your movement stick from me. It's just saying. <laughs> um, now, now what I'll app, what I'll have to do definitely because I've already I'll have to figure out a way to make those sticks attachable to the bases that I have as they are because I don't want people who have already bought trays from me to have to buy new trays if they want to use a stick to move them around. Yeah, that's so definitely that's hard that's a problem implement. I'll have to solve. Yeah, yeah. so um, I mean, I. I could do it, but I mean, the, the easy answer to it would just be to take, say, the, well, you have the picture up. So the three row in the back of the orcs, right? Hmm. The easy answer to that would be to, you know, lift the orc off, put in a, put a separator in between that orc and the magnet below it, um, and then have that stick out and then set the orc back down and the magnets will pinch together and hold that thing in place. But what's going to happen is that orc's going to be raised up higher than the rest of them. Um, so that's the easy answer. Um, that'd also be the easy answer to, you know, being able to join multiple trays together. Um, so a lot of it has to do with, you know, how thin can I make it and make it still functional and how willing are people to have models up that high? Yeah, that's always an issue because especially with um, certain terrain, it can kind of become tricky because at some point someone's gonna be that guy especially in a tournament where it's like oh well i could just see the tippy top of your model because of the tray and it's like oh and a reasonable person would accept that that you know isn't visible but if you run into one of those people it can create some challenges yeah you know and oh look and then i have somebody mad at me your movement tray got me shot in the head so <laughs> uh, yeah um so yeah, that's actually a thing I'm gonna have to work out with that stick and that tracking because it's one of my biggest pet peeves right now is trying to keep track of all the health. I mean, you know, orcs they have one wound. I just oh look, one's dead. But my other models, you know, I'm sitting here with a pencil and eraser and pieces of paper. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something I'll have to work out. Yeah, because um, I feel like it's gonna be becoming more um prevalent as the editions go on because as i'm looking at some of these new york codexes because i cover as many as i can and i'm looking forward to covering the orc one when it comes out but um uh you know the the abilities are getting kind of bloated in a lot of ways and it'll be interesting to see of different ways of handling some of these things especially since the bookkeeping seems to be getting harder and even looking at something mm -hmm. like our castellans which have two weapons of the same name but different stats on them or almost the same name, but different stats. It'd be interesting to find ways of kind of, well, I guess it's just using different colored dice, but stuff like that, you know, over time, it's going to be more and more emergent. Right. See, yeah. I'm on, on the note of the orc codex. And again, this is one of the things that's going to make me smile and make my brother cuss. Uh, the whole toughness increase. Like, I'm, I'm very excited about this. <laughs> uh, uh especially with the uh take that because he already hated it when i you know had uh the art boys which bumps their toughness up one or is it their toughness up? Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. bumps their toughness up one yep. yeah art boys and then you got you've stacked that with the kff um which gives you know gives them that plus f or five up involved hmm. um and then you know you, you 
if you if you're lucky and get all of your support characters around them uh, you know uh, that, that group of boys becomes ridiculous and then just that one more toughness oh I, I, it, it just sounds so nice right now like i'm <laughs> i'm super excited about the the new codex um, oh, yeah, that's crazy i saw that i was like wow five toughness i'm really happy that a lot of my guns yeah. can oh, get up oh. to five strength and don't forget the ap yep the ap is yeah. huge um yeah and that's another thing is is i'm guessing your your codex is going to have something that i've been seeing in all the new codexes recently so for example uh mechanicus has um holy order so you can pick a tech priest and give him a holy order that has uh so th- to give you an idea why i was thinking so much about that whole issue was okay so you you can pick any number of tech priests and give them and you can each use each holy order only once so let's say i have two manipulatives one might be holy order magi one might be holy order genitors but then holy order magi and genitors each have three parts to them the first part being that once per game you get a command point discount then there's an active part and then you switch it you can switch it to uh advanced part but you can no longer use the first active part so just having mm-hmm. some easy way of like tracking those three things because you know you have two different manipulus with different buffs at some point you're going to run into an issue where someone says no no i thought it was the other manipulus that had magi or oh right, you already right. used that command point or you didn't so like having some kind of like thing i can kind of take apart and fiddle with or even if it's just swapping out to mark and i know there's cards and markers and stuff already but i would like something a little more you know easy to use i guess ease of use Okay. Um, I'll have to look into those roles so I can figure out what I can do. Yeah. Um, now, like for command points, I mean, my table that I have, because I, I, I built a, you know, 96 inch by 44 inch table in my, for, in my garage, just, just to play games on. Um, and it's the one in the picture on the left. It's, it's black and I oh, okay. um, put a clear coat over top of it, but on the ends of the table, um, I have, I don't even remember what they're called, but you know, like the beads on an abacus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have on each end of the table, I have, you know, screwed down into the table, a thing like that. We use that to track command points. So, you know, there's never any confusion or mix up for that. Um, So. Well, well, this is more, this isn't necessarily command points. What it was, was. um, Tracking the abilities and their use in their stage. Because there's an ability that you can use once a game to reduce the command point cost of one stratagem once a game. So like once you use it, it's gone kind of thing. So, I mean, you could put a die on it or something, but it'd be nice to like have a very nice visual because, you know, something I can paint up and clip on and off, you know, something magnetic maybe. Uh, Maybe that flag idea where it's like different sections can be taken off on and things like that. Or, now, with the flag idea, unfortunately, I, I, I think I'm going to have to be fairly generic with it. So think and like, think like uh, you take the top of the flag and, you know, it has places where you can stick stuff and everything would have to be color coded. So you'd have to like assign this is this color, this is this color, this is this color. Um, and now if when I get the laser cutter, I'll be able to cut and etch things um now you know my hands are tied a little bit well actually a lot of it um by you know trademark and copyright laws you know i can't infringe game workshop oh, and of course. they're not friendly about that at all so that that is actually one of the battles with doing what i do um mm-hmm. because you know i when i'm listing stuff in my descriptions i have to be somewhat abstract um uh and like even with my the movement trace, like part of me in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm I'm just waiting for it for Games Workshop to see, send me a cease and desist because they claim to have a copyright on the negative space inside the base. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be surprised though. Uh, copyright can yeah. be really ridiculous. Um, so yeah, that's one thing I'm always worried about when making my videos because I do mention stats and things like that, and I'm always like, well. Uh, how do I do this in such a way that I don't get in trouble for it? Because they could potentially take the whole channel down if they get. Um, uh, you're you're anyway. actually fairly covered on that. If I'm again, don't take my advice completely. But uh, if you're using information as a critiquing or commentary, yeah, that's, I, that's I don't true. know the exact terms. Uh, then yeah, fair you know, use law. 
Um, yeah. Now, if you're just going to sit there and like make a video of you just like, oh, look, these are the rules and just posting out pictures <laughs> of them. I'm sure they're not going to be happy about that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it, so. it is it is yeah I, I exactly get what you're going on and that's what I try to do is when I try to mention them, I break them up a little bit too so it's not just like here's the stat block you'll see in my videos what I do is um I go well they have a strength of six and a, a five attacks and that's very good and and then I'll like go a little later over oh and the survivability stats here are they and you know I'll write it in such a way especially in the slides to kind of make it a little more broken up so it doesn't just look like I'm posting a stat block. But even then, it's, you never know. Because um, a lot of people got in trouble a while back when they changed the rules about how much um, of a clip you can play. Because before it used to be, I think, 17 seconds, then it went down to like 10 seconds. So a lot of people's old videos had to be taken down. And then there was a guy who had, who actually, here's the craziest part, was he had an outro that he bought the rights from the person who made the music, but because the contract of that person was owned by a company, they went after it. So he had someone make a uh, flute version of that song, like a cover where someone did like a mm -hmm. uh, very poor flute music. And then they went after that still, cause they said they had a copyright on the like tune itself. So even if it was a cover by someone because he was monetized, that's where they got him. And luckily YouTube let him basically re-edit and re-upload all the videos with the part being silent. But it was amazing to what lengths they would go to like enforce um, copyright in an abstract sense. Oh, no, there's a, um, on that, expect like on the tunes topic, uh, I, I read something about it like a year or two ago. There were these guys and, you know, people were, uh, you know, causing copyrights on beats and it was slowly diminishing the, types of beats because those copyrights that are claiming them they were kind of broad mm -hmm. so even if you use a section of it you can get you know hit you with copyright so they developed this uh computer system that would go through and basically create every iteration of every possible beat known to man <laughs> or, and even even those that aren't and even the ones that sound awful and just wouldn't work and no one would publish and uh, i can't remember how many but it was in like it was either in the hundreds of billions or trillions of different beats they put out or they, they made with this computer. And then they put it all on a hard drive and uh, then they took it and they registered it and they all made it, they made it all for use. So they own the copyright to all of those beats that the computer made and anyone can use them. So oh, if okay. you end up, so if you end up making something that is one of those beats it's all public domain. You're free to no, yeah, it's all public domain. Okay, so that's they're, cool. they're not like yeah, they're not giving it out per se. You know, you can't go download them, but no one can claim them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was yeah, that's like you know, they spent money and time and effort and to just give the world something. Like that's something super commendable. Oh yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, I always I always like people who um do things like that because I think we all benefit from when we can use different things um, of that nature. And obviously there's always someone who's going to do something that's, you know, obviously on the wrong side of fair use where they're just re-upload. A, a great example of it was React channels. And while I think people have the right to do a React channel, there are ones where they would literally just put the video up, have a little face cam in the corner, and they wouldn't even move throughout the whole you know, video and that's, and they're like, well, it's fair use. My face is there. It's like, well, you didn't say anything. You didn't even make a facial expression. You were pretty much stoic the entire time. And you played the video in the entirety of someone else's content. And it's like, is that fair use at that point? I would say no, but there have been other cases where, um, someone re-uploaded a section of a video on their channel, uh, in full. And it was deemed fair use because, the audiences were significantly different and it was supposed to base it and they changed the title. They changed the title to something mocking it because they were basically in disagreement and they thought the person who made that clip proved themselves wrong. So the judge ruled that was fair use because um, the context of the video uh, or the section of the video being uploaded was um, transformative enough. And I guess in that sense, if you're using it like that, where you're just like, this is the same argument I make, but you know, they think they're proving themselves wrong, right? Whereas I think they're proving themselves wrong. So there is that gray area, and yeah, it, it's super complicated. Essentially, is where that yeah, is. that's 
the problem with that is, you know, people abuse it and because people abuse it, they, it, that gray area gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. So and it's, yeah, it's always complicated. Cause again, um, it's hard to know which side where it fall on. And obviously the law is never, it's not, you know, it's not a, it's one of those things that's like, depends on the judge and depends on the lawyers and things like that, how they argue it at the end of the day. And yeah. Nobody wins essentially by the time it's in the court case. Yeah. Well, no, the lawyers win, they get paid. Oh yeah. <laughs> they always win. <laughs> Unfortunately. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. But the law is just so convoluted. It's just so hard to keep up with. And that's why there's lawyers. Yep. <laughs> And it's expensive. That's the biggest problem is, is someone can uh, take advantage of that as well, which is unfortunate mm-hmm. in many cases. Um, anyway, but getting back on topic, <laughs> on that little tangent there. Yeah, well, well I mean, we can kind of stay on in the same zone here. Oh, yeah. So, like, uh, I've been told, you know, I really should patent my stuff, mm-hmm. right? It, have you ever looked up the cost of a patent? <laughs> it's not cheap from what I know. I never. No, uh, it's like five to $10,000 to get a oof. patent. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I'm looking into other options because, you know, the the Deep Strike Roller, trying to patent that, I mean, anyone can make that. Right? Literally, anyone who has any basic knowledge that it, it's not, it, it's apparently it's something new that people haven't seen before. It's a new idea to, to make it in an arc. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, anybody can design it and anybody can make it. It's the the structure of it is not into innovative, I guess. I, it'd be the use. Um, and now it does have some flaws, unfortunately, um, that I really don't think there's any way to work around. Um, from a, I mean, there's fixes to it. Um, and I think it was yesterday I was actually talking to somebody about it, and uh, because what you get, um, okay, say we use a picture on the right just because it's a little clearer because of white background. Um, say you have something with a fifty, 50 millimeter base right Hmm. and you put that up against there well because of the nature of circles what you're going to get the far end corner of the arc to the 50 millimeter base at the point is going to be nine inches if you move over slightly around that curve it actually gets closer so because i have the design drawn up already with I, i can use that as something to gain or garner measurements and very very accurate ones so i you know i can draw a 50 millimeter circle right at the end of the point in the software and then draw a line and measure it so what actually happens is uh on a 50 millimeter base you get it's like 3.1 millimeters at the closest is the distance is actually closer Hmm. now in practical play people aren't going to be that critical unless they really want to be now i mean you can easily fix it kind of with the same way you deal with the straight line you just wiggle the thing back and forth and it'll push the guys um but from a practical standpoint you know if you're using a tape measure you, you're measuring from a single point on that base and you're finding your nine inches um so you're getting the same result as if you had used a tape measure but of course there are those people that are going to be like oh but by the nature of circles it's going to be this much closer um, <laughs> Yeah, you always so, have someone trying to find some advantage, especially if they're losing a lot of times. Yeah, so, you know, the best thing I can tell you to do in that situation is, you know, put your finger on the center of the arc, put your finger on the tip of the circle or the tip by the point, look at the person that's uh, causing you problems, just kind of give them a look and then take your finger and then wiggle the arc a half inch back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> look. Um, so like I said, impractical play is not going to come up. I, I you know, it, it's three millimeters. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you know, when you go to make your charge roll, I mean, are you going to, are you three millimeters in your charge roll? Um, yeah, the question is like, do you really want to play with those people anyway? I mean, we're here to have fun, not do math. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I bought this thing so I don't have to do the math. Just come on. Let's just go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anything that makes um, tournament play faster. I mean, <laughs> a round lasting three hours plus, especially when you're playing, you know, three, four rounds a day. Uh, anything that yeah. makes it a little bit faster is always nice. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but you, you're talking about a whole game running three or four hours. Yeah. So, like in a lot of tournament oh, you games, are so efficient. 
Uh, well, well, this is this is the, this is where you're. So, like, casual game can obviously last way longer, but um, when you go to an event, a lot of times because they have to fit in a certain number of rounds throughout the day, you'll oftentimes be limited to something like three hours. Um, and you know that's for some armies, it's not too bad. But I've also um, the first um, episode I did of this podcast. Uh, one of the things uh, mentioned about, especially like tournament turns someone once took a 45 minute turn you know and it's like well <laughs> you know we have three hours to play your first turn took 45 minutes and ideally they get quicker as models are taken off the table and things but if it's just yeah. the movement phase it was a 45 sorry it was a 45 minute movement phase and it was just the person playing slowly so um you know it, 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 that's always going to be a, a difficulty with something like warhammer where it's a very physical game and you're moving pieces around and you know the, the number of pieces can range anywhere from five with imperial knights to uh what 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 is your typical army size as an orc player when 2000 point games would be concerned uh my typical or my um uh, i'm gonna make you not like me uh how about both or do you want both both Both? okay uh my typical army size uh let me math here real quick so uh 90 Probably around 120 to 150 models. Um, my, I'm going to be that guy um, over 200 because, like I said, when I'm just feeling mischievous, I'll, I'll put 90 orcs and 90 grots on the table um, <laughs> and just, you know, stick a war boss and some other stuff behind them and just, you know, drown you in bodies. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so as an orc player, and, these, these bases are pretty much mandatory. I mean, I've, I've seen some yeah, of this. With- that's... Th- three yeah. squads of 30 boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's three squads of 30 boys. It's, it, it, like I said, I haven't had a lot of luck with, um, with trying to play a vehicle army. I, I just, it, I always get completely destroyed. I mean, granted, um, typically the armies I play against, uh, are my friends. So, you know, Admech, Death Guard, and, uh, um, uh, Black Templars, Space Marines. Um, so, yeah, generally, I mean, I, I, I'd add Slanesh to that list because of my wife, but um, we can't play versus each other most of the time because, you know, married couples bicker and it just <laughs> it turns all bad. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> um, and real, really quick, let me answer Pyro's question here. Um, as per the updating the models on the Def Coptas, the Tank Busters, and the Commandos, I would say all of those because they don't own any yet. So since I don't own any, I'm not invested in those, so let's get some new ones. Uh, okay. And then back to... Wow, I that completely made me lose my train of thought. Hold on. Uh what was I? Help me out. Uh, orc unit sizes, <laughs> vehicle lists. Yes. yes. Uh, Necrons. Right. Or is there? Do the Necrons fit on the Admech bases or the Necron Warriors and stuff like that? Because they they do. Uh, the Warriors. I, I believe the Warriors are thirty-two millimeter bases. Uh, okay, so those would be the same as the Orcs then. Yes, same as the Orcs. Okay. Yeah, because so. uh, any army that has a Veil of Darkness effect, so Necrons, Admech now with Lucius Solar Flare. They're going to really want these bases because, again, they're going to have to be redeploying a squad of 20 units. And, again, moving yeah. five b- blocks of bases is a lot easier than 20 individual models. Yeah, 100%. Because, yeah, when we, again, when I first started playing, I didn't have as many boys and it was miserable. Um, so, like, I couldn't imagine trying to field a 200 plus model army without having bases to help move them around. I mean, we, we were t- we'd we be talking like, oh, look, I'm going to have a, you know, hour and a half movement phase. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. um, it's like, you so, know, hey, you know, go watch a movie. I'll move my models. And when the movie's done, I'll be finishing up. Um, yeah. No, that's why I like Catafrons is they're just expensive elite. You know, you get your five in a unit that's like 200 points. <laughs> it's not really anymore, but... <laughs> You know, yeah, that's so, a number of yeah. stuff. I, I I kept looking like, you know, my friends, I keep telling me, you know, you should get a different army. You should get a different army. Um, and part of that's probably because they're like, hey, I'm tired of playing your orcs. Um, 
but I, 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 I can't quite bring myself to branching off of orcs. Um, no, they are personality wise. I'm sorry. Oh, they're your army. They're the one you want to play. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't yeah, have to be well, switching army just because of you know. Well, when I first when I first started it, I picked up the uh, I think it was the commander box or the elite box, the one that didn't come, the Necron Space Marine box from Ninth Edition that did not come with the terrain. I picked up that one. Oh, okay. So that might be either that's elite then. Okay, so that's that was my first delve into uh, Warhammer, which started a downward spiral of empty wallet. Um, so, and I started with, you know, I've, I've, I've chosen Necrons because uh, hopefully I don't make anybody mad, but Space Marines are just generic. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we all hate Space Marines here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I was painting the Necrons and I just got tired of painting metal. And my personality wise, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a, just a silly person, you know, um, so again, Necrons are just seem kind of serious, you know. I I can like funnel and like, oh yeah, they're cool. De- de- I'll be honest, Necrons are cool. They just don't fit me as something that I want to spend hours with. Um. So and then you know I started looking more into the orcs and how ridiculous they are, and you know that just like oh, I could do this and it just makes sense and you know like. We'll be playing, and my friends will be like, "Hey, why, why is this or why is this?" And at this point, my answers has just become because orcs, and they've just given up and just you know, like okay, because orcs. Um, that is how orcs because, do things. <laughs> yeah, it's just they work because they're orcs. So, um, luckily, I don't cheat with that, and I'm like, yeah, I I can move from one side of the board to the other side of the board every turn because orcs. And but the problem is, you know, if I have a uh, with my um, why did I forget the name? The, they, they have a vehicle. Ah, Shock Jump Dragsta. So the Shock Jump shock jump Dragsta, if you have the right things on it, it can move from one side of the board to the other side of the board every turn because it teleports across the board. Um, and with the right things, you don't have to roll. It just does it. You just advance it, and it teleports to wherever you want to set it, you know, within the nine-inch roll. Hmm. So, uh, and, you know, and that's kind of an example of orcs right there. I just made up a cheating rule and just realized, oh yeah, orcs can do that with the right unit. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, it's becoming a little more common with armies as well, where uh you get Veil of Darkness, Solar Flare, etc. Which is cool because mm-hmm. it lets you kinda you know, negate some of the um silly stuff like okay, a, a unit of hive guard behind terrain that's like on the other side of the table. It's like, well, you know, uh sometimes it's hard to reach it if you don't have anything in deep strike or it forces you to put something in deep strike. Because um, mm-hmm. they can shoot through line of sight, uh, and line of sight ignoring is becoming more common. So, again, um, so we are kind of getting to the end here. We've we've gone over a little two hours. Um, so we always have a few questions we ask everyone. Um, the first one always be what What's your favorite model? Uh, you can say both an orc model and a just a general forty k model. Um. My favorite orc model right now is my war boss. Um, again, I can't say it's my favorite exact model, you know, from just looking at them, but it's the one I've spent the most time on. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time painting it. I, I spent a couple hours just on the face. Um, so right now, that is my favorite model that I own. Um, the favorite model, just by looks of it, would probably have to be uh, the. Sh- Boomdock a snaz wagon, and there's really you know one major feature on that that I think is hilarious, and that's the grot that's strapped to the front bumper. Um, and then my favorite overall model. Yeah, it could be 40k or Age of Sigmar, or anything really. Um, I would have to say, and it's still I it's up on my shelf, still in the box because I'm, I'm getting my orcs, my main orc army done first before i even delve into that but i wanted to pick it up um would be the mangler squigs from gloom Gloom spike gets um if you haven't looked at the model it's really cool (laughs) (laughs) so yeah yeah Yeah, definitely that sounds like a like a good choice um squigs are always fun 
I remember uh, back in the day, um, the Night Goblins with the uh, big metal uh, mace, the Fanatics or whatever they were called. Those are always funny because they would just hurl themselves and sometimes you would backfire and they would destroy your things. But I also remember the squig squads and things like that. So it was always, I always liked the works and things like that. They're, they're always entertaining and I love how um, creative work players can get with some of their kit bashes and everything else. So definitely. Yeah, like I'm with, sorry, you just brought something up. I know you're trying to close the show, but I'm going to hold you for just another we, second. We can take, we can take our time. Uh, we can take our time. Uh, but with the... Uh, the tank buster boys like one of the models in your thing can have a hammer that's a hammer with a rocket attached to it like the rocket is the head of the hammer and you know you hit the thing and then your unit dies <laughs> <laughs> from <laughs> like that's just orcs in general that's just kind of spells them out right there so yeah, definitely. yeah. and all the, all the contraptions and stuff i mean you know ludos look great uh killicans um yeah, the killer cans are the little ones, right? It's like the big death dread, but killer cans instead. Yeah. Okay. Those guys always look cool. Uh, all the little guns and turrets and cars. I mean, they get kind of expensive quick because you have to have so many of them. But like I said, I saw the uh, orc updates and I was like, oh, I can't wait for the new codex. I want to do a series on them just so I can learn about them. Because uh, right now I'm not too familiar with them. I've seen some people play them and I've seen some of their lists, but. I, like I don't know the nitty gritty of how like orcs can do everything. Like if you told me, oh, they can do this, I'd probably believe you just because orcs can do <laughs> kind of whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, if it sounds ridiculous, it's probably yeah. true. Because was there? Um... Oh yeah, speaking of which, uh, which remind me of uh, the uh, uh, the what's what's the thing called? The uh, I'm sure it's a great description. What's the thing called? Um, uh, the one where it shoots the grot inside of a person. Oh, that that's the. Uh... Big mech with shaka attack gun is the model. Yeah, that one. I had no idea what it did yeah, until yeah. I read the description. I was like, what? Yeah, it fires the grot through the warp who usually comes, you know, lore-wise, who usually comes out completely nuts from being through the warp and just, com- yeah, just... <laughs> Inside of a space armor and, or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then, you know, you dig a little deeper into the lore. You have new, one of the new models coming out. Um, I, I can't remember his name, but uh, for the Beast Nagas, there's the... I'm going to have to look it up. It's going to drive me nuts. Hold on. While well, you're looking it up, actually, here's an interesting yeah, question. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion of the direction of the Beast Nagas versus the normal orcs? Because obviously the Beast Nagas are much more feral, and obviously there's all kinds of orcs out there from freebooters who are the pirates to, you know, uh, all the different ones. But um, do, do you think that's something that, uh, Games Workshop might do more of where they're making orcs more feral, or do you prefer the more kind of Mad Max style of orcs, which we see typically currently? Um, I don't know which direction they're gonna go. They're probably I, I well, let me put it this way: they're gonna go the direction de- depending on what people start using, because that's just smart business sense. So if they put out the beast snags with the squigs, and people start transferring over to them, um then that's probably the direction they're going to go. Um, I like the idea of them because I always like squigs, and that's why I you know, bought that box of squigs to use for uh, Age of Sigmar to use as uh, Gretchen in my army, is I like the squigs, and you know, it gives me a little bit of color variation in uh, my army. Um, so they may go that direction. Um, they may stick kind of where they were. It, it, probably just going to depend on response but knowing um warhammer players we're, we're just going to buy whatever they put out it really doesn't matter I, <laughs> yeah, they could okay. sell us a pack they could put out oh look new plastic cube and we're we're going to be there with our 50 dollars to buy their plastic cube dude i'm um, looking forward towards my uh admec plastic cube i, I don't know what you're <laughs> <laughs> uh all right the model is uh Zodgrod Wart Snaga. Oh, okay. I think I know that one. It's the one with the crazy blue hair, which really oh, stands okay, out because yeah, yeah. orcs and hair. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but yeah, have you heard the lore behind him at all? No, I haven't. I haven't read up on it enough. Um, all right, uh, I'll be brief as possible. Okay, uh, okay. He was Snakebite Clan, mm-hmm. and um, he believed he he was a runt herd, which the runt herd is a model that kind of controls the grots. Um, they're kind of like their overseer. Um, well, he was a runt herd, 
And he believed that if you, in, I'm, I'm going to use this term really lightly, nurtured the grots, <laughs> um, they would become better. So, but that became a lot of problem. You know, there, there was a little conflict of, you know, practice there. And um, I can't remember off the top of a head, uh, top of my head, but there was a Big Mac, which are the mechanics. A Big Mac is a bigger one. Um, that was either, I can't remember if it killed or abused uh, one of his grots he was in charge of. Um, so he took the Big Mac and fired the Big Mac through his own shock attack gun. Oh, so what happened when he did that? He got kicked out of the snakebite clan. <laughs> that's, that's anticlimactic. Yeah, I, well, I don't know the very specifics to the details of his kicked out, uh, uh, okay. but it ended with him being basically banished from the snakebite clan. He's now like a hermit that lives outside with a bunch of grots? Probably. Yeah, um, by cool. what I've seen of the rules, um, I, again, I don't remember the specifics off the top of my head, but if you have him in your army, you can take a unit of grots and make them better. Oh, so I can't. Nice. I can't remember if they. I can't remember if they shoot more accurately or they get a little tougher, or what exactly. But I always yeah, like stuff the, like that where you can make a unit a little bit stronger and uh, more powerful because it can give li uh, a little more life to some units that are a little more on the fringes. Um, but picturing a uh, big mech being shot through a shock attack gun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you uh, one of those things coming out yeah. of there. Yeah, well, that's another thing that's uh, it hasn't drawn an, as as enough of as much attention as it should, but it's going to cause people a lot of grief. Is the toughness increase that's coming to the orcs? Yep, they're up to also applies five. to the also right, but also applies to the Gretchkin. Oh, okay. So the Grots are going to go from toughness two to toughness three, which may, means a damage four weapon or a strength four weapon is not going to wound on a two anymore. Yeah, that's true. Um, so that'll make a big difference, especially if people start fielding a lot of Gretchkin. Yeah, that's true. Uh, how comparable are they to, like, Scarab Swarms, I guess? Um, I don't know the stats on the Scarab Swarms, so unfortunately I can't compare them. Um, I can tell you the stats on the Gretchkin. Yeah, let's, let's see. Uh, they're, right now, you know, they're Strength 2, Toughness 2. Uh, I think they... Melee on a four, hmm. and they shoot on a four, as opposed to five with the rest of the orcs. Um, and you know one wound. So basically, they're you know they're made of paper right now, um, and their weapon is like a strength two one shot one damage pistol. Oh jeez, that's kind of a weak pistol. So yeah, these, well, oh, okay. they're they're five points. Oh okay, so like three of them is fifteen. They have one wound each. Yeah, they have one wound each. They're five points. You can put them in mobs of thirty hmm. or units of thirty. So you know, and but you don't have to. And they they have the they're a troop, and so you, know, you can. Yes, they're opsec. Okay. Um. And, uh, you know, they're one of those ones that you don't have a unit limit. So when, when I put 90 Gretchkin on the board, typically what I do is I put in 90 or nine 10 man units. Hmm. Um, so, you know, you go through the deployment phase. Um, generally, by the time I'm done putting my Gretchkin down, uh, my opponent is either all done putting theirs down and I just get free reign to place all my, you know, important units down um, <laughs> where I want them. Or, you know, they got like maybe one or two other units to put down afterwards. That's, so that's pretty clever. Yeah. Gives you a ability yeah, to be very strategic. Yeah. And, you know, I just put a wall of, uh, you know, cheap models in the front. Um, now, when I do that, of course, it limits what I can do with my larger units, putting them on the board because it does, you know, 90 hmm. times five that's a lot of points to put down um <laughs> but it's also you know 90 wounds that ever, i can just cause grief with have you ever ran out of space in the deployment zone yes 
<laughs> How often? Uh, it depends on the board size, but uh, I have changed my army list specifically to make sure I fit in the deployment zone. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, <laughs> just... Yeah, like I mean, if, if go, watch some games that are played by with orcs involved, mm-hmm. and the deployment zones are ridiculous, especially when they have a lot of terrain. Yeah, I can it's imagine. just an, it's it's a nightmare to deploy, and everything's all packed in, and like that's playing orcs in tight terrain is the dream of anyone with a bomber <laughs> plane that can just fly over. <laughs> And, uh, it's, you know, we have our few slaves that are very good right now. And, uh, we have our three bomber lists, two bomber lists. So <laughs> yeah, you can imagine. Um, well, I guess they're, they're, they generate mortal wounds, so they're probably not as effective, but, uh, unpacking a unit of 20 Rangers or 20 Skatari or Vanguard, uh, is probably gonna be a lot of fun into a squad of orcs, especially cause yeah. the, uh, Vanguard auto wound on a four plus with a stratagem. So the toughness gets negated. So <laughs> Well, yeah, there's that too. Um, but yeah, I mean, killing orcs is easy if they don't, if they're not death skulls and they don't have a custom force field, any AP kills orcs. Oh, okay. Yeah, but because I mean, plus armor save or something? Six. Six. Oh, okay, so they have t shirts and nothing else. Pretty much. Hmm. Um, so yeah, any AP tends to wipe out orcs. Um, I mean, even some of the, you know, you, the character models or the more, pricier models they just you know like tank busters they're just orc boys with better weapons uh for along the lines of their stats um and I, there's a lot of them that are like that at. and so i mean killing the orc models is really easy but their orcs have a way to yeah there's a lot of them and if it's done right you know like i said you stack the custom force field with the uh Ard boys to make a toughness a little better because, and I mean, even if you just def, def skulls, oh look, def skulls have a end bone save automatically. Hmm. Um, now, one of the problems with fielding the Gretchkin, um, they don't benefit from any of the clan cultures. Oh, okay. So, say the def skulls, they get the, you know, plus one, or they get the uh, six end bone. Uh, I, I think it's six. Off top. Yeah, six. They get the six envol. The Gretchen's not going to get it. Mm-hmm. Any unit that's Gretchen's not going to get it. So your killer cans aren't going to get it. Your mech guns aren't going to get it. Um, oh, so are the killer cans just filled with Gretchen or? Yeah, it's the killer can is a um, it's a Gretchen model. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Oh, there's like an orc yeah. sitting inside of there. No, the uh, Death Dread is the orc. Oh, okay. And that is the um, orc's answer to the. Uh, I can't. I, it was just there. Uh, this. I don't remember what it's called. The, yes, thank you. Um, it's in the it's in the orc name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's the answer to the dreadnought, um, which. I don't remember off the top of my head what the combination is, uh, but if someone plays a Death Dread and they do the right combination, it can be ridiculous because uh, you, you like to do a charge and you give them the four melee arms, and so they get all those attack extra attacks from the melee arms, and then if you uh, spin the stratagem, or you play the right stratagems, uh, every model they kill gives them an extra attack. Oh jeez. Is it is it limited in the same way like um the hex mark destroyers where if they get that extra attack they can't get an extra attack off the extra attack? Yeah. But oh, okay. uh, if you do it right, I think I think they get six attacks. Oh okay, so they go up to like twelve or something if they get each of them. Yeah. So and that you know, if you do it right, they're hitting very hard. Um especially if you give them the one of the things gives them a charge bonus. So they get oh, okay. bonus damage on the charge, and it's just, yeah. So they can just rip through a small squad. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine with something like that, especially if they have, like, the damage on the weapons and things, which they probably do because they're, like, a Dreadnought-style unit. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's 
Yeah, orcs are orcs. They do orc things, and it doesn't have to make sense because it makes sense to them. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, well, uh, I guess uh, one other thing is we're if we've obviously kind of touched on this already, but it'll be in the description as well, link. But if people want to find you, people want to contact you, where's the best place to do that? Uh, my store is on Etsy. Uh, the actual URL is you know etsy.com slash shop slash grease monkey games. Um, you can try punching in just grease monkey games.com. Sometimes I'll be honest with you. Sometimes the forwarding doesn't work correctly and it's been causing me grief because I used to just promote that. And then I found out the links weren't working. Um, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but for, as a general rule, you know, etsy.com slash shop slash grease monkey games will get you to me. Um, so that's kind of how you track me down. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they can either email you or they can message you on Etsy, correct? Yeah, they can message me on Etsy or um, you can email me at, you know, feedback at greasemonkeygames.com. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, if, you, if you send them yet, yeah, if you send that to me over on Discord, I'll put the email address in the description if you want as well, in addition to the link. Um, I don't know if you want that in there or if you want that just to be something people uh, can find. Uh, Either one. I mean, it's a it's yeah, an episode, it. so it's however they feel like doing it. Um, one last question before we kind of conclude. Where did the uh, logo come from? Because I saw you had kind of an interesting looking logo uh, of like a super monkey kind of thing. Um, where that? Yeah, the logo. Um, I was looking for a logo. I needed a logo. Um, I ended up going just because um, the one of my customer that um i have that works for the uh advertising company he's actually a graphic designer he's just in a he's in a crunch on a job right now so he's not free to help me out with certain things until next month um so he's going to draw me up a different logo the logo i have um i basically i was just looking on the internet i found a logo site um and it was kind of a mass market thing like oh you can pay this much to get the logo but everybody can buy the logo well there's an option to pay a little extra so they can't sell it again. And that's kind of where I got the logo. Um, so I think we're going to maybe, I, I got to go over back and forth with him on it. Um, stick with something similar, but we are going to make some alterations to it at least, or we might just kind of take a different direction with it. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Uh, in either case, I look forward to seeing the new logo. It'd be cool to see what you come up with. Um, and obviously seeing all of your new products down in the future. Cause uh, I like I like what you do. I think it's very cool, and I like that it's a small business, and um, it looks like it's all very customer focused, which is huge for me. And I always like supporting businesses that do that kind of thing. Um, as I mentioned, I already ordered some products, and I really want to test them out um, and you know play around with them because <laughs> it just looks like fun. So yeah, yeah. yeah and my personal goal is to empty your wallet while making you happy. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> way. We both went that way. <laughs> <laughs> Until later. So, <laughs> but, hey. uh, but yeah, thank you very much for coming on. We'll have to do this again sometime in the future. Um, you know, don't be a stranger. And if you want, yeah, um, thanks for having me. Uh, no problem. Happy to have you. And uh, again, once again, the link to the store will be in the description. If you want, you can also post um, a link to a shop on my uh, subreddit there. It's not very active. There's only a few people every, every now and then, but it's, it's a place people stop by, especially after these shows. Um, so thank you. Um, the episode will go down. It'll be back up a little bit. Uh, once it's just kind of edited, I'll put some timestamps for points of discussion and then, um, I'll send you a link on uh discord chat and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great night.